witness is the Northern Ireland. Okay, members, uh, welcome to a meeting of the uh, Justice Committee, and if you can do the needful with your electronic uh, devices. Uh, with apologies from Patsy McGlone and Emma Rogan, if there's any other apologies. Um, I think Linda is here, and Paul will be here shortly. Um, Christine, do you want to indicate if anyone's delegated their authority to vote? Yes, um, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. There's the draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 23rd of April. If members are content that they're a true reflection uh, of the proceedings, then I uh, will sign them accordingly. Content? Right. Content. Do you, uh, some matters arising. Uh, Ministers for Justice, uh, pr response regarding the provision of oral update on COVID-19 justice-related issues, uh, pages 13 to 14 of the meeting pack. There's correspondence from the Minister. Um, she will be here today to provide an update in respect of that issue, which we will be commencing uh, very shortly. Uh, item two is the uh, justice response providing additional information following the overview briefing on Safer Communities Directorate. The committee did consider a correspondence providing further information on a range of issues following the overview briefing on Safer Communities Directorate at the meeting last week and agreed to defer it until this meeting to seek the views of Mr McGlone on the timing of briefing the human uh, trafficking and modern slavery. Uh, Mr McGlone is content for the briefing to take place when the research report uh, from the Santa Marta group is available, which the department has indicated is unlikely before October. So if members are content, the uh, briefing then on human trafficking and modern slavery will be scheduled once that research report is available. Agreed. M3, there's a copy of a, a letter from the Minister for Communities regarding domestic abuse uh, victims and a range of housing issues. Um, at the meeting on the 2nd of April, the committee agreed to write to the Minister of Justice regarding the gap in housing allocation scheme and the current position in which victims intimidated as a result of domestic violence are not awarded housing points and ask her to discuss this with the Minister for Communities on how the scheme could be amended to address the issue. The Minister for Justice has provided a copy of a letter that she has sent to the Minister for Communities on the issue and several others relating to the granting of secure tenancy for victims of domestic abuse, the shortage of emergency accommodation for male and LGBT victims and the availability of funding for the Men's Advisory Project and the Rainbow Project to attend multi-agency risk assessment conferences. If members are content um, to ask the Department to keep the Committee updated on these issues as responses come back. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay, item four, revised guidance for Assembly uh, Committees during the public uh, health crises. Chairperson of the Chairperson Liaison Group has asked for the guidance for the Assembly Committees during public health uh, crisis to be updated and drawn to the attention of all committees. Uh, the substantive position regarding committee meetings during this period has not changed and the focus mm. should continue to be on COVID-19 and other essential business and meetings should be kept as short as possible, which uh, we seek to do. Item 5 then is the Department's response providing additional information following oral evidence uh, with the Minister uh, on key justice issues and priorities from the 27th of February meeting. The Department has now provided additional information the Minister undertook to give to the committee during that evidence session. The response covers a number of issues, including current position on advocacy support, uh, service consortium models, statistical information on prison population and firearm certificates and appeals, the engagement the Department has had with the NIO on the regulatory framework on abortion, the ongoing qualification of the Legal Services Agency accounts, the current position on the review of antisocial behaviour legislation, and the Department has also provided a copy of the research entitled Explaining Disparities in Prisoner Outcomes. So, members, that information is, is there for members to note. Um, there may be information from that members will subsequently uh, wish to raise at a further point, but if you're content uh, to note the information as currently provided. Go ahead. Okay, item four then is the ministerial briefing on the COVID-19 and related, related issues, and we'll just give the minister an opportunity to come into the meeting. So ju just as the minister is um, taking her place, um, members were asked to submit questions in advance of this uh, evidence session. Um, a number of members did so, and uh, we have grouped them into relevant different areas. So uh, the way we're going to handle this, and the Minister has agreed um, in communication between the Department and the Committee Clerk, there will be 
an initial brief overview remarks made and then we'll take each grouping and the Minister will be able to respond to those questions that were submitted. I'll then go to each individual member who had submitted those questions um, before I'll open it up to others who, who haven't submitted questions, um, but then other members can feel free to come in. The intention is that this will take no longer than 90 minutes, so members and Minister, if uh, we can w work with each other on that, that would be appreciated. So at this stage, um, can I formally welcome Minister for Justice Naomi Long and Deborah Brown, Director of the Justice Delivery Dir Directorate in the Department of Justice to the meeting. It will be recorded by Hans Howard and then that will be uh, published in due course. So, Minister, I will hand over to you at this stage. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation um, to come to the Justice Committee today. And also thank you for the reassurance that it won't be a marathon session like the last one, um, because it was pretty long for all of us. But hopefully it was a good engagement. It was certainly very helpful for me um, to be able to have that engagement with you at the beginning um, of the term. So I welcome the opportunity today specifically to be providing an update on the department's response to COVID-19 um, and the ongoing challenges that we're facing in that regard. This builds on my earlier year statements of the 16th of March regarding the department's initial response to the coronavirus pandemic and one on the 30th of March on the temporary release of some prisoners. Um, I was the first minister, I think, to take general questions from the Assembly on COVID-19 on the 23rd of March, when the Speaker agreed to my request to make a statement to the Assembly. And you've also heard evidence now from a number of my officials in the last number of weeks um, in relation to COVID-19 and the departmental response. So I want to express my appreciation first and foremost to the members of the committee for their very constructive assistance and support in what have been extraordinary times. The department has focused on ensuring key services are maintained, and that staff and those in our care are protected and the public safety is preserved during the pandemic. The department was quick to organise response and within days of the World Health Organisation declaring COVID-19 a global pandemic, we had stood up both our departmental operations centre and our business continuity arrangements. Both have worked well in providing the evidence and analysis to support quick and clear decision making and identify issues which need to be escalated to the executive um, or to the civil contingencies group. The department has also played a key role in the executive strategy for dealing with COVID-19. We have two work streams within that strategy. The first is ensuring the continued safety of custodial environments. We've already heard from officials about how prison service and the Youth Justice Agency have continued to achieve this. This has taken significant effort by a large number of people, and so I want to pay tribute to the staff within both of those organisations. The infection control measures put in place within custodial environments, including precautionary isolation for new committals and the availability of personal protective equipment for staff, have meant that none of the prisoners or young people in our care have tested positive for COVID-19. Five prison officers have tested positive for COVID-19, and our thoughts are with them and with their families at this difficult time. Our second work stream within the executive strategy is to make respectful arrangements to respect the dignity of the deceased. This has involved two main actions for the department. Health has also helpfully issued guidance to funeral directors in that regard. The first action for justice was to establish additional mortuary capacity through the development of a temporary resting place at Kinniger. Staff in my department, partners and contractors worked extremely hard to develop this site within a very short time frame, and it has been handed over now from the contractors. I sincerely hope, having visited the site, that we never need to use it. The second action has been to ensure funeral directors have enough personal protection equipment. Despite some initial difficulties, the situation is improving and sufficient PPE is now available for them. While the work in prisons and on the temporary resting place are significant, it would be remiss of me not to mention the excellent work that has taken place more widely right across the Justice family. Staff throughout the department have risen quickly to the challenges we faced as a result of the pandemic and have quickly reorganised to ensure that key services continue to be delivered and operate. Additional IT solutions have been provided at pace in order to allow remote working where possible. Over 80% of our staff are now regularly working remotely or on site. We're using ROTAS to help facilitate social distancing. And this has meant that not only have we kept key services going, but we've also been able to continue delivering on a number of the department's key priorities throughout this time. A good example of this, I think, is the domestic abuse bill. Um, and I know many of you were engaged in the second stage debate on that piece of legislation earlier this week. There's been much in the media and nationally on the issues of PPE and testing. We have had a clear focus in the beginning on ensuring our frontline staff are adequately protected. 
Prison services worked hard to secure PPE and sufficient supplies continue to be available. We are monitoring stocks of PPE across frontline areas of the department, as well as within the PSNI on a very regular basis, and sufficient supply is there. Testing has been available for frontline staff who need it now from the 7th of April, and testing capacity has been ramped up further from the start of this week. I also want to pay tribute to the PSNI, who have played a key role in policing the coronavirus restriction regulations brought forward by the Health Minister. As I said previously, I believe fundamentally in personal freedom, but I also believe in personal responsibility. If people will not take responsibility for their actions, then they have to be held responsible and accountable. And so I'm grateful to the PSNI for their key role in those difficult circumstances. The lockdown that we face remains in place. It is right, though, that we also plan for what happens beyond this period, whenever that might be. Work has begun across the executive on recovery planning. This will be undertaken within each department, but within an overall framework for the executive and other public bodies. Our aim in recovery planning will be to manage a gradual return to more normal levels of operation, but also making sure that we retain some of the very positive ways of working that have been introduced in respect of the current situation. Our recovery plan will take into account public health advice and the need to deliver important public services in the best way we can. Work is still at a preparatory stage, and if the committee is content, I will ask officials to brief the committee when we have done more thinking on those issues. Finally, I am planning to make a statement to the ad hoc committee on the department's COVID-19 response at some point next week. Okay, thank you, Minister, um, for that overview, and, and we'll pick up. I think on some aspects of that when we go into the different groupings. So I'm happy to move straight into the first grouping, which is in respect to the regulations uh, that have been imposed um, in terms of the restrictions that are now in place. Um, I know you should have got sight of the areas that we're covering on that. So if you want to make some remarks. Yeah, um, I just have a very brief um, opening remark in respect of the regulations. Clearly, I am not, as Minister, responsible for those regulations. That is a matter for the Minister of Health, um, who has then brought those forward with his <coughs> recommendations. And the enforcement of the recommendations and the regulations is an operational matter for the PSNI. While these lockdown and social distancing measures are having an unprecedented impact on individuals, and I think we all recognise that they're also impacting on businesses and on communities, they are essential in limiting community transmission of COVID-19 reducing the number of excess deaths and protecting our public and essential services. If we contrast the original figures, which were shared with us by the Health Minister at the beginning of this pandemic, of a prediction of around 15,000 people who could lose their lives as a result of this first wave of COVID-19, with the current uh, projected figures of around 1,500 people, I don't think anyone would question the effectiveness of the measures that have been taken. The restrictions are working. But it is vital that we do not become complacent. We need to maintain public confidence and adherence to those restrictions if we are to maintain the ability to protect everyone as we have done so to date. Um, on, on the issue of um, maintaining public confidence in, in the measures that have taken place, can you comment further then on the initial interpretation of the regulations that the police service um, applied to this, they've indicated that they got their own legal opinion on it, um, although that did run contrary to police forces in Great Britain and, and what they took, particularly in respect of exercise. Uh, granted, the issue has now been subsequently clarified by further uh, reasonableness and, and circumstances that the executive agreed, but initially that interpretation um, did cause issues which I think people would then question in the future confidence in decision making that's being taken by the police service that would be helpfully clarified? Well, I think first of all, the PSNI's legal interpretation and uh, enforcement of the regulations is an operational matter um, for the Chief Constable. He's accountable to the policing board and I've committed to respecting the operational independence that he enjoys in that respect. Um, I think that certainly at executive level, um, there was no indication um, that what was being suggested by the police in the context of the work that they were doing uh, was going further than the medical um, necessity um, of the work that was being done. Um, but obviously that is a matter that was mainly resolved in liaison between health and policing. Um, and whilst the Justice Department is helpful, uh, is, is willing and able to assist with that, 
um, it ultimately comes down to those two um, bodies liaising together um, to resolve any queries. In terms of the regulations, um, the Department of Justice would have been involved, as, as we know from briefings, in drafting the regulations. Um, so is it solely a matter for health when it came to these regulations that the police service said that they were following, or was there any input from your department in the drafting of the regulations? The drafting of the regulations was a matter for health, and justice only made input on issues that would have impacted on the justice um, on the justice element. So, for example, the issue of penalties is one where the justice department would have had input, um, but we wouldn't have had input into, if you like, the basic health premises behind this. So, for example, the nature of the restrictions that were going to be included within it, or the powers that were being given um, to the first and deputy first minister or the minister of health um, to make uh, rulings on those regulations? Because I know um, the police service, whenever the clarification was provided by the executive, um, they had indicated it would have been helpful if it had been more clear. However, whenever Alan Todd was at this committee, he, he said that it wasn't something that they had been seeking um, clarity on initially, but whenever there was a problem, then uh, sought to, to uh, seek that clarity. Um, and I suppose it's just having confidence that whenever these are now being applied, that the police do have discretion whenever the law has been breached, but they don't have discretion to make up the law. And there would be a concern that they were going beyond the law when it came to the interpretation around the reasonable and that reasonable aspect of this, and that's why the clarity needed to be given by the executive. Well, as you'll be aware, that's actually subject to a judicial review, and so it wouldn't be, I don't believe, helpful or appropriate for me to speculate on whether they went beyond the law um, or simply um, Im Im essentially enforced the law as it existed with the reasonableness test. Um, so I think that's one that the, the courts will ultimately look at in terms of retrospective. In terms of the current situation, um, I think that the clarification has come um, with respect to the regulations and what was, I think, believed by the executive to be implicit is now explicit. And that should therefore make it much more simple for the police um, to do their job. Has there been engagement with the Attorney General by way of the, the guidance um, being provided? I understand there's been conversations with the prosecution service who were involved in drawing up the guidance in England um, for the police service, uh, and there's been uh, conversations with the Attorney General's Office, the Public Prosecution Service and the PSNI to ensure that what is understood to be the correct legal interpretation is being applied and that guidance is provided for that. Well, I shall appreciate the three um bodies and individuals that you've named um, operate independently of the Department um, of Justice. So I can't really answer um, for any of them in respect of the conversations that they may have had amongst themselves. But it has certainly always been our view in the Department that we need to take a joined up approach, not only at executive, but as the Justice family um, when it comes to dealing with these issues. Well, I certainly agree. The police have been doing an excellent job in this area. Um, I was stopped by the police, um, questioned about why I was coming to Stormont. Uh, and the, the female officer was more than pleasant and understanding and, and accepted it. Um, and were, you able to, were you able to assure that it was essential? <laughs> Coming to see you, Minister, is always essential. Um, but I know there has been examples where that isn't always been the case in terms of how some officers have interacted with the public, and it hasn't always been um, what uh, would be expected. Um, um, but uh, certainly in the large, uh, I can understand the difficulty they're under and the way in which they're going about replacing off it. Um, before I move on to some other... I'm sure other... it would be worth saying also that perhaps not everyone that they interact with would be as courteous as yourself when they do so. And it's worth bearing in mind um, that the police have always taken the three e, the four E's approach and it's only at the end that enforcement comes in. So where people are willing to engage um, politely with the police, um, where mm. they're willing to be encouraged to take the advice seriously, um, often enforcement notices aren't required. It's simply a matter of asking people not to do whatever it is that they're doing that they shouldn't be. Um, enforcement is the last line of defence, if you like, in this. So, um, I mean, there is, I think, increasingly um, a pushback um, from people in terms of the advice that's being offered to them, not only by the police, um, but I think anecdotally people who work in shops who are trying to enforce social distancing are taking quite a bit of abuse, mm. council staff taking abuse. And I think we need to reinforce um, 
in terms of our leadership politically that those who are giving this advice are doing it in order to try to keep people safe. Um, it's not in order to try to um, be fun sponges and make everyone's life a misery. That's not the intention. Um, and I think that people need to respect the fact that when they're being asked to do something, it's not um, because people are trying to control their, de their day to day lives unnecessarily. It is to try to save lives and to keep them safe. Um, but I do think that obviously the police will have had their fair share of abuse um, while they go about doing what is an important part of their job and keeping the community safe. Agreed. Um, Rachel, you'd asked some specific questions on this, so I'm happy for you to come in. Thank you. I think a number of my questions have actually been answered in the previous session, but in terms of the guidance that is issued to the P PSNI, does the department ever have sight of this? Well, I mean, in terms of the guidance that would be circulated to the police, it would be for the policing board to scrutinise um, and also um, for the chief constable because it's operational, so we wouldn't have oversight of operational matters. Um, but, I mean, I have seen, for example, um, the National um, Police Chief's um, guidance, which was published online. Um, so I've had sight of that, and I know that the, the approach that they were taking. Um, and I've also had conversations, obviously, with the chief constable about the approach that he was taking and his officers were being advised to take, um, but not in the form of them passing on published guidance. Okay, thank you. And just finally, and this is, I'm sure this will be coming up um, for a number of ministers, but with the potential reopening of certain um, churches or household recycling centres or um, garden centres that has been on the news this morning. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms, and this again, this is an operational matter for the police, um, in terms of guidance issued for people who are maybe travelling to these places, would that come under the, the justice sort of directorate? Um, and would that be issued to police so that if people, say, are travelling to a household recycling centre, if they should they reopen, that they would not actually be breaking the law? Well, the issue in this is that there may need to be changes to the regulations in order to allow for travel. In some um, cases, tr uh, travel which accompanies the particular essential activity is permitted. In others, that is not quite so clear. Um, and so there may need to be further changes in the regulations if we reach that point. I think the importance both for the police and for the public at large is one of clarity and consistency. And so I think that when the messaging becomes muddled and when the public become confused about what is being required of them, that you're much more likely to get conflict um, when the police ask them to do something or not to do something. Um, I think when the messaging was very clear and concise at the beginning and people were very confident about what they were being asked to do, actually people in the main were very happy to do that and to continue to do that for as long as was required for health reasons. But in terms of the preparation uh, of the travel restrictions, again, those are health-led. We are only asking people not to do things for health reasons. The coronavirus uh, regulations and indeed the legislation was very clear that this is only for the coronavirus pandemic and so there are no there are no powers um, for ministers to use the legislation for other purposes in terms of controlling people's movements or anything else like that. So it is only where it is um, required in order to protect people in the pandemic. Um, and so it wouldn't be it wouldn't come directly from me, but it would come from the executive, but via the health department. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, Paul, Paul. Um. Yeah, sorry. Hayden, 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 Christine. <laughs> sorry, Paul, you had, you had submitted questions on this as well. Yes, and I please accept my apologies, Chair and Minister, for being late. Uh, just was running late. Uh, I couldn't make it for the start of the meeting. Yeah, I would have worries around this, and I hear everything the Minister states about the best intentions and the fact we're doing these things to save life. I agree with all of that. But with this draconian legislation, it's completely abnormal what we're asking the police to do. So it's inevitable that things will can go wrong. And whilst 99% of the operation will be a very good and slick one, there have been instances whereby grave mistakes have been made, and some of them quite peculiar and some of them quite serious. Uh, family members bringing hot food to a, a, an older loved one. Um, we happened to live in a village, a satellite village out of the main population centre, were, were refused and turned round. I don't know if the Minister has ever had the good fortune to visit Buckna, but a Buckna resident was coming to Brasheen to do their shopping, and the police officer told her she should do her shopping in Buckna, 
and the Ministry would probably realise that there's no shops in Buckna. So even, even local knowledge is a massive issue here with regards to the police uh, and where they're stopping vehicles and how they're stopping vehicles and, and the, the local knowledge that they have. So it can do tremendous damage to the confidence of the police and to the executive by extension. And we're talking about freedoms here. The, these laws are so... They, they bore right into the, the psyche of a nation and the freedoms that we have, which would, we should all guard and, and defend uh, diligently. So there, is, there are issues here and peculiarities that we will have to question and deal with when we're looking at and scrutinising this legislation. So I suppose, Minister, are you concerned about some of the stories you've heard? And, and if you are, how, how do we get that? You talked about clear messaging, and I get that. But on the other hand, people aren't stupid. So, so how do we get the messaging out there that this has been a, a, a very good success and the police have been trying their best, but, but we need to iron out these mistakes? Well, I mean, there are a number of questions, I think, rolled up in that. So I think, first of all, I would say that I can't answer, obviously, for the operational issues around policing. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to do so or to comment on individual examples, um, other than to say that, yes, I'm familiar with both Bucknah and Brookshane. <laughs> so um, my family are originally from Bushmills, so I know the, that end of the country quite well. Um, you're correct that these are abnormal um, times abnormal um, impositions on people's personal freedoms. Um, you don't need to um, encourage me as a liberal um, and somebody who believes in personal freedom um, and free choice um, for to say that these are major impositions um, on people's freedoms. But they are also in abnormal circumstances. So a pandemic um, is not normal circumstances. And for me, the test around this legislation and whether it was proportionate and appropriate um, came in the form of, first of all, the fact that it will lapse automatically after two years, that it does have restrictions, that it can only be used in this pandemic. And therefore, if there were to be, for example, even another pandemic that were to come around, new legislation would have to be brought to Westminster and scrutinised, and that process would have to restart. It will be scrutinised by Westminster every six months um, in order that they can decide whether or not it can be repealed sooner. Um, and also the fact that the regulations themselves are reviewed every three weeks um, by law, um, I think provides the checks and balances that are required to ensure that what we are not doing is a power grab over individual personal freedoms, because that's not something that I would be comfortable with or that I would endorse. But I do believe that the ultimate personal freedom is the freedom to be able to live. And I think that if you are doing things for public protection reasons um, with a good justification, then it is reasonable and rational um, that at times like this, the government has a duty to protect um, the public and ensure that people are kept safe. And so it is about striking a balance between that duty of protection and people's individual freedoms and responsibilities, um, because it's not only about freedoms, of course, it's also about responsibilities. And as part of a community, we don't only have responsibility for ourselves, but for our neighbours and the rest of our community. And if we as individuals behave in a reckless fashion and put other people in danger, um, then there is an element um, where we have to intervene, as we would on the normal justice and the normal flow of justice. So all of our freedoms are ultimately curtailed by exercise of them responsibly. In terms of the individual circumstances that you've mentioned, as I say, I can't comment on those, but I can comment more generally on some of the reported issues, because having discussed them uh, with the police, um, as you would expect, I would have done. Um, a number of them are not accurate in the reporting. Um, a number of them have been exaggerated. Some of them didn't occur at all, um, and some of them occurred other than in Northern Ireland. Um, so, I mean, there have been a number of issues undoubtedly. I mean, the police service, I think, would be the first to admit um, that they're not perfect. None of us are. Um, officers will have their good and bad moments, as everyone else does. Um, but I think, in general, the police have behaved appropriately and proportionately. I think that's reflected in the small, relatively small number of enforcement actions that have been taken and the context in which those have been taken. And I think that people have, in Northern Ireland, greater oversight in terms of human rights um, and personal freedoms, in terms of the accountability structures around the Ombudsman's Office and the Policing Board. And there are mechanisms if people feel that they have been inappropriately treated by the police, 
that they can make complaint through the various mechanisms. And actually, the number of complaints have been relatively small um, that have gone to the police ombudsman where that's been necessary. And of those that have been received, the vast majority are for informal resolution. So they would be on the less serious end of complaint. So I think all of that should be reassuring that this is not about authoritarianism creeping into the system more generally, but it's about a genuine attempt um, by the PSNI to support the executive and to support the Department of Health um, in trying to tackle this pandemic for the public good. Um, and I would hope that people would cooperate with them. But also, I would have to say, not rely upon them um, to police the pandemic. We each have individual responsibilities and need to exercise our judgment wisely. And just because you can do something does not make it wise to do something. And so I think that people need to show a degree of personal restraint <coughs> as well. And we shouldn't expect the police to police every part and parcel of our lives, every choice that we make, every decision to travel or not to travel. Um, we just still do have some freedom in that regard. And I think that we need to use it very wisely at a time when people's lives are still um, at risk from the pandemic. Can I ask the Minister, just on my final point, and I, 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 I agree with her with regards to individual responsibility, and that that's really basically what the common law, what we're built on, I suppose, as a nation, uh, and that we should trust people more. And, and you know, even if we talk about some organisations, even if the civil restrictions were lifted, they would still impose their own restrictions, which is wise and good. But you talked about a balance. So are the, is the executive mindful of that balance whereby whilst we're doing these things to save life, there has to be recognition also that it could destroy lives. And are you, as an executive, very clear as to where that balance lies and that we start to debate about the destroying of lives because of these restrictions and, and that may be the reason and the rationale for lifting limited restrictions at places and times? Well, I think that there are a number of elements again to that. First of all, I can't speak for the mind of individual executive colleagues, but I believe that the executive, and I can reassure members that the executive have discussed the impact of these restrictions in terms of mental health. And we know that the Department of Health, along with the executive, have now brought forward plans that were originally in place um, to appoint a mental health champion. Um, and we believe that doing so at this time is important because we recognise that there will be a degree um, of impact on people's mental health from isolation. Um, and we have, I mean, I was one of the first people at the start of this pandemic. Unlike most people, I was in lockdown before the government required it because I had a, an, infe an, an infection in my lung, therefore had to isolate um, during that period. And then the, the pandemic um, restrictions came in afterwards. So I've been with, I've, I can probably count on the fingers of both hands. How often I've been outside the house, and most of it has been in this building for work. Um, and that would be from the end of February. So I am not immune to the impact that this has had on individuals' lives and the way we go about doing business. Um, and it does have an impact that's unquestionable. Um, my own family, some of them are shielding at the moment. And so because I am able to go to work, I'm not able to see them and I have to take that into account. So this has an impact, I think, on all of us. And there's none of us that are, are immune to that or ignoring that. I think that the priority um, where we are now is about protecting the health service capacity to deal with the first wave of this pandemic and hopefully ensuring that as we move beyond the pandemic, the first stage of this, that we're able to do so in a way that, first of all, creates confidence so that the public are clear about what it is that we're asking them to do and why. Um, I think that the communication of that needs to be clear and consistent um, across the executive. I also think it's important that we set out a plan from where we are now to whatever the new normal might look like. I personally would like to see that done in stages so that we have a, this is where we are now, this is stage one, this is lockdown, this is what it looks like, this is what's expected of you. Stage two may look like this. We're not saying you go to stage two now, but we're saying this is what it will look like when we get there, and this is what we will expect of you, uh, and this is how it will work. Stage three beyond that will look like this, and this is what we will expect of you, uh, and this is what we will do to support you. And I think if we do that, we can then confidently say to people when the time is right, we can go to stage two or stage three. And perhaps back to stage two, because bear in mind this may not be a linear progression. We might find ourselves going backwards. But unless we are clear about what each stage looks like, 
We will end up with an a la carte lifting of restrictions, which will cause maximum confusion in terms of the public mind. And we will see people no longer clear about the why of the restrictions. And that uncertainty and that sense of anxiety is also very damaging to people's mental health. So the public unravelling of, co of um, coherence around the regulations will also cause people distress and anxiety. And we need, therefore, to be very cautious when we have these conversations that we are conscious of the impact that it has on people financially, psychologically, um, and in terms of their physical health and well-being, and that we factor that into our decision-making, but also that we are clear that the primary aim of the regulations is to protect life, to prevent the, the National Health Service becoming overwhelmed, um, and to ensure that people are able to eventually move back to some form of more normal operation, though I suspect the future will look very different to the past, regardless of how we do it. And I think we need to do that in a measured and proportionate way and be led by the evidence. Um, and I would be concerned if we end up with an a la carte unravelling um, of the decisions that are taken, because I think that that will cause huge anxiety and may well take some pressure off us as politicians, but may transfer on to others who then have equally difficult decisions to make at the individual level about whether or not to open their facility, their business, or whatever it might be. Um, and that will cause huge anxiety for people as well. So I think we need to work with people to find the right balance, and we need to listen very carefully um, to those on whom we are then conferring that responsibility in future so that they are properly supported in the decisions that they take. Okay, thank you. I think, M Minister, having the, 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 the conversation around this and what it looks like uh, is something that I do feel is important. Uh, I think the communication is important around the, the regulations and, and the instructions that we should be having. I would have a concern, though, that people that raise issues are then uh, don't, don't go into that territory uh, and we don't have a conversation, because these conversations are happening in people's homes. They're happening through the ways in which they're having contact. Uh, and so there's a balance between the holding the line and the effective messaging of what we're currently doing and in having a proper, open, transparent, accountable process to have the conversation about what things look like and as needs arise, being able to articulate that. And moving forward on an evidence-based position, it's important that we have confidence that people's decisions now is based upon the CMO, the Chief Medical Officer, the Scientific Advisor. And that kind of drew into sharp focus, I think, of the debate around graveyards. We know that there was a paper brought forward by the Health Minister to open that up. And it didn't get approval for over a week. Stephen Farry was on your colleague. I know you didn't support that at that executive meeting. So, what, why, if it's on evidence, you didn't support it for seven days when a paper had already been presented? Well, first of all, I'm not here to answer questions as leader of the Alliance Party. I'm here to answer questions as Justice Minister, and I have no locus over the opening or closing of graveyards. So that's the first thing. But you have secondly, a position on the executive. Secondly, I do have a position on the executive. And you're expressing um, those opinions. And I'm not expressing those when I'm expressing a view on matters like that, which I have no locus over as Justice Minister. I'm doing it as leader of the Alliance Party. The second issue um, that I would want to raise in respect of that is that you have announced here that you are aware of how I voted at the executive. You didn't hear that from me. Um, and there is an issue of confidentiality, because if we are to have these conversations, they should be private conversations that are had within the privacy of the executive. Well, it was well documented. So that we can, so that we, well, it wasn't well documented, it actually. It was through the media. Well it, oh, well, it was through the media, but it was yeah. your colleagues, I think, who might have made that information available to the media, because it certainly wasn't me. Well, I listened to so Mr Farry's position that articulated the Alliance Party, which I assume would have been your can, position at the make, executive. He, Stephen is not here to answer your questions, and I'm not here to answer your questions as leader of the Alliance Party or to engage in a party political debate. I'm happy to do that elsewhere. I'm here as Justice Minister to answer your questions on justice. When it comes to the issue of the executive, I believe that executive discussion should be confidential. Your own um, party leader has said that she believes that the executive should be a, sp a safe space where we can have these confidential discussions in order that we can explore ideas and thoughts and concerns. So that's the first thing to make clear. With respect to the issue of cemeteries um, and more widely how we approach the step down, I've made very clear how I personally believe that should be done and why. But when it comes to the issue of the Justice Department's input into that, there was a, a, an evidence base brought to us by the Department of Health 
and it was based on the Chief Medical Officer's assessment in terms of health. However, there are other consequences of actions that are not necessarily direct health consequences, and therefore we need to also look at those. So, for example, um, in my engagement with the executive, and since that's now been opened up for discussion, I'm quite happy to say that in my engagement with the executive, the department did make representations with respect not to whether cemeteries should open or close, because that is not our role, but as to the impact that, that would have on the policing of travel, as to the impact that that would have in terms of public interpretation of what was essential and non-essential as a journey. In relation to the additional powers which may need to be conferred on those, for example, um, in public authorities to police um, the regulations and the social distancing on their property, because it was clear that we don't have police resources um, to do so in graveyards, nor, frankly, would it be appropriate um, for us to do so. And to consider the unintended consequences that some of the rather large funerals that we have seen um, during the course of the lockdown, which were happening on the street, publicly visible and able to be um, subject to police surveillance and indeed, I think, referrals to the Public Prosecution Service, that those would then move instead into a cemetery setting, which could place um, public officials um, in a degree of difficulty, because they would then be expected to disperse groups of grieving mourners at funerals, which I think is an invidious position to place people in. So we didn't raise that with respect to saying do it or don't do it, but we raised it and asked the executive, as a minister should, to consider the consequences of those decisions and what mitigation measures might need to be put in place in order to address those issues. And anything else that I expressed in that meeting was a political um, view uh, from my own perspective. But from a Justice Committee perspective, it was based on evidence. It was based on the policing evidence and on the legal ramifications um, of us moving away from the situation that we had been in. With respect to the medical evidence, the reason that I am not in favour of an a la carte approach, where we simply take individual issues and assess them, is that if you look at R, so that's the, the, the rate at which the disease replicates in our community. If you look at how R is affected by any individual decision, the impact on R may be quite small. So, for example, when you talk about cemeteries, the discussion was that people could, individuals could attend cemeteries um, and lay flowers at a grave, and that, that would not cause any difficulties. That is possibly true, provided the caveat was provided proper social distancing was maintained. I don't know how many of you regularly visit graveyards. I'm somebody who, who does visit my parents' grave and would normally have done so during the period of lockdown, but I wasn't able to. Unfortunately, we had a number of anniversaries. Mother and father both died in March and also their wedding anniversary in March and Mother's Day and Easter. So it's been quite a lot of uh, missed opportunities. But when you go to a graveyard, you also use communal taps, which people will touch and handle. And we know that the virus can exist on those taps. And how do we clean those taps? Do we know that people won't pick that up? Often people who will go to graves, and I'm there often enough to see them, are older people. So we're encouraging them then to make journeys, potentially taking them out of their home to somewhere different in that environment and perhaps touch things that other people have touched. There's also the risk, of course, of people coming across and speaking to each other. And actually, in some of the news reports around that, you could see it happening in the background live. And then, as I say, there's the additional issue of larger gatherings at grave sites because funerals are not possible in churches at the moment. Um, and so people might opt instead to go to the grave site and stand in larger numbers. Now, you might argue, even allowing for all that, that the impact of cemeteries reopening on the replication rate of coronavirus in our community would be small. But then you have the unintended consequence of the message that it sends out about what stage we're at um, in terms of the virus, that we're now in a relaxation phase. And so we saw, for example, a massive increase in traffic over last weekend and this week, 20% up on the week before. So you have the unintended consequence of sending that message out. And then if you take another small decision and you say to the health department, well, what would be the impact of this small decision? And they look and they say, well, individually, if you do it right with the right social distancing and nobody does anything they shouldn't, the impact on R will be quite small. 
And we could end up in a situation if we don't have a properly structured plan, where we take lots of very small decisions that have very small impacts, and the cumulative effect of them is to push R back up above one. So my concern is not about the individual decisions or the individual requests. My concern is about the cumulative impact that relaxation of the regulations might have on the replication rate of the disease in the community, the impact that that would have on the health service and, and successful treatment, but also the unintended consequences um, that we can create by taking certain decisions in, at certain times. So I think it's important, and that's why I go back to what I said, I think it's important that we have clarity about each stage, what it will look like, and how it will be managed, and what we are expecting of people. Hmm. Because ultimately, we cannot stop people um, breaking these rules. I mean, I was asked this morning um, on the radio by Stephen Nolan, what about people who go to visit an elderly relative, they sit in the garden, they social distance, can you or can't you? Look, the reality is I can give you my view on that. But if people are going to do it, they're going to do it. And we can't expect the police to police people's back gardens or front living rooms. And it's not my job to do that either. But we can be clear about why we are concerned about people moving around, gathering in places, risking extra contact that is unnecessary. And we can be clear at what point we feel that the risk of that has reduced enough that social distancing alone, as opposed to what we have now, which is stay at home, um, is the right point in, this, in the process of renormalisation to be at. And I think it's about clarity and consistency so that the public are not anxious because they're uncertain as to whether what they're doing. I mean, I, I, I like everybody else, am also a constituency representative. And many of the emails I get are from people who are anxious and worried because they don't know if they're breaking the rules or not. So we need to make sure that there is that clarity and reassurance for people that they understand how to make those judgments and on what basis they're making those judgments because we can't um, legislate for every possible um, scenario. And that's where I think we need to be very careful about taking a kind of a la carte approach um, to easement and take a more structured approach as to how we go forward. But that's an argument that I need to make at executive, because what I want is for executive to process this in a way that is agreed and consistent and coherent, um, and one that has collective responsibility built into it, because I believe that that ultimately will give people the maximum confidence that we know what we're doing and we know why we're doing it. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'll not go over all of the points that you've raised. I, I disagree with your analysis that you speak as a party political leader through virtue of your Justice Minister role in the executive uh, and that distinguishing feature. That's something that you can rationalise. It's not something that I agree with. We will agree to differ on that. But well, I'm it's keen. quite clear, just to be very clear about this, it is quite clear that we are appointed both um, on behalf of our party um, and also to a particular ministry. And I make it very clear in any correspondence where I'm expressing a political view in the executive that it is my personal and political view. And I also make it very clear when I communicate where it is a departmental view. And that distinction is no different to the distinction made by any other minister in the executive. That's on the record. Um, in terms of some other members around this aspect of it, because I'm keen that we move into the other five areas, um, Gordon and Linda have indicated they wanted to comment, um, and then we're going to move on. Gordon. Thanks, Minister and Deborah, for coming this afternoon. We do appreciate your input. Uh, when Alan Todd came here, I think we as elected representatives were very concerned about the need for compliance and for people to take it very, very seriously, the need to, to stay at home. And that, that was the message. And, um, I have been in continuous contact with the police and do as a local representative. And, um, from, and we have been, and obviously, like the minister, we've been emailed about lots of issues. But I truthfully cannot say I've had any complaints about the police and the handling of this aspect. And that's in a constituency where, if you take ours in North Down, which is more than my constituency, but there's 170,000 plus in the council area. Now, I, I spoke to the senior officers and went to the, the trouble of doing that uh, about a week ago. At that time, they had issued, I understand, less than 20 cautions to people. Uh, 
And in a number of cases, they were repetitive. There were young people that were driving around in a car from one town to another, as an example, and have been stopped in the various towns. So I must say, to be, from what I've seen, the police were out at risk as well to themselves, those officers. They are serving their community, they're in our communities, they live in our communities, and I think they were, they, you know, they were doing something that we were not aware of, of the total risks behind the whole thing. And I must, to be fair, I think the police, from what I've seen and the evidence I have seen, I think they've been reasonable, and there may have been cases that they went far and beyond what was required, but I must say, in our case, I think they've done a reasonable job. Uh, they were very supportive of the local council in relation to closing uh, public areas. We wanted a lot of our parks areas restricted for parking. That was done with the support of the police. The police continued to monitor it. And in the main, the people complied within our constituencies very well, I believe, and in fact throughout Northern Ireland. And as a result, I think it's been positive. And I think uh, we need to you know, record our, our appreciation to the police for what they've done to date. They've had issues about PPE, and we, we know all that. But uh, I honestly do think they have, you know, made a genuine effort and continue to do it, or continuing to do it. And have officers set aside with their COVID teams to deal with it specifically, and I think we we should continue <coughs> to support them and what they are doing. Well, I think that's very much appreciated, and I will certainly um, pass that on to the chief constable. Um, and I would agree with you that the police have put themselves again in the front line of what is a very complex issue. They weren't. Um, policing public order and all of the normal things that they police. This was a health emergency and it's therefore unique circumstances. I think they have done it proportionately and I would agree, agree with you if you look at the number of um, fines and cautions and so on, they've been relatively low in comparison to um, some other parts of the UK. And I think also you're correct that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that in the vast majority of cases, the public have been remarkably um, mm. compliant with the regulations and supportive of them. Um, of course, there will be those um, who you know, have ignored them, and I think that some of those circumstances have been particularly um, stressful for others. But I think in the majority of cases, people have worked together on this, and I think that there's a huge amount that we can learn that is positive from this, um, because it's clear that there is a sense of public spiritedness with the majority of people. There is a sense of community um, with the majority of people. And so I think whilst Inevitably, as is always the case with justice, we focus on where the failings are. We shouldn't forget, um, quite rightly, I think, to say where the strengths are. And I think that sense of community spirited um, activity in the community, whether it's supporting those who are vulnerable and shielding, or whether it is the, the general levels of compliance uh, with the regulations, is something that is very welcome and is very important. Um, it's not been an easy time for many people. Um, it has created financial distress. It has created emotional distress. Um, it, we know from the debate on domestic abuse that it has created certain jeopardy um, for people who um, may find themselves isolated in abusive relationships. It's also very difficult for people who, in terms of managing their own mental health and well-being, find um, contact um, and kind of community a really important part of that. Um, that it's not been so easy to achieve. But what it's also shown is how creative people can be, um, because we've seen the kind of technology, the use of technology, to maintain um, the links that people have. And I know that some people have talked about churches. I mean, one of the things that's been incredible for me to watch um, are just the number of people attending my own church on a Sunday morning, virtually now, um, who possibly would never have come um, on a normal Sunday. But are able to join with us and the sense that you're part of a community at that point um, I, I think is actually quite important so I think people have used technology creatively I think they have assisted and I don't think we should lose sight um, of, the, of those positives and I also think it's something that we need to capture going forward because at the other side of the health crisis around coronavirus there will continue to be huge stresses and strains financially economically psychologically minister can I can through. I try and move us on, because I do want to, for your benefit and our own, try and get through, and there's a lot of specific questions members have, so Linda, I'm okay. Okay, can, I, can I move us to the, uh, the next part then?
um, which is around the impact on the Department for Justice. Yeah. I'm not sure if you want to make a, a comment. Just Very briefly, um, yeah. as I said, we're focused on ensuring our key services are maintained, our staff and those in our care protected and public uh, safety um, pre uh, preserved during the pandemic. We do have key services to deliver, um, and we've been recalibrating our wider business, conducting our work in creative ways, as I was saying, um, using best use of IT. Some areas of work have slowed or stopped because we've needed to focus on urgent work, um, but we are continuing to deliver business as usual in a number of priority areas, um, and particularly those that we feel will make a a difference to people individually, so things like the domestic abuse bill and others. We've also commenced the recovery planning to prepare for a return to operations um, post-pandemic, and further work's planned over the coming weeks to understand better what that might look like, um, because, as I say, I expect it will be not the normal, um, but a different and new normal that we will be moving to. Okay, thank you. Um, Doug, on this section, you had a couple of questions on Kenniger and Legacy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, all I was after, if I could, um, uh, Minister, and and I'm just trying to get a, a better understanding of the cooperation and how things work, and 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 see what agencies have actually tapped into helping you with the, with the Kenniger. Now, we're absolutely with you on this. We hope we're never going to have to use this, but there were a lot of agencies that did come in. Um, uh, and I just wonder if you could just sort of outline how we went about acquiring Kinniger, creating Kinniger, yeah. uh, and how it's now being controlled. Well, I mean, I have to say that as somebody whose background is in construction, um, one of the most impressive things has been how quickly we went from what were essentially um, large, empty industrial sheds to what is, I think, possibly the best morgue facility in these islands. And I, I don't think that's a boast just for the Justice Department. I would have to say I would, that that is probably true. Um, the police have indicated that that is their view, and they are people who are specially trained in body recovery um, in emergency situations. Um, as you know, we took the decision um, to try to find a site that would be suitable um, for, uh, for finding a mortuary facility. That was a very sensitive and difficult issue because at the point where we were making those plans, I don't think public realisation of the extent of deaths had fully um, been recognised. And so we had very limited opportunity to go and seek um, land and sites because we didn't want, um, obviously, to increase speculation around that. Um, we put in, after discussion with executive colleagues, we made a request for military assistance. Um, and w they essentially provided us with the site at Kinniger that is completely self-contained. Um, it has its own entry point and exit point. Um, it is very well screened, um, so because we, we are conscious of dignity around all of this. And we then were able to get contractors who have gone in and built um, a, a facility that is um, really top class. Um, the police, um, in terms of their body recovery specialists, would be the people who we have agreed would run the facility so that they would make sure that the, the remains are properly stored, um, that they are properly recorded um, on the system, um, and that we don't run the risk um, of returning the wrong remains to the wrong family, because that would be incredibly traumatic and insensitive. And so throughout this process, we have um, had to think very carefully about how we would manage this. And it's not something I've talked hugely about for the very reason that it's sensitive. But when I watched the news and saw mass graves um, in New York, I have no regrets at the investment we made in this facility, because I would not countenance wanting to see people from Northern Ireland be um, have their, their loved ones remains disposed of in that kind of fashion, out of necessity, in fairness. Um, but I wouldn't want to see that happen. And I believe that the facility that we have provided is a dignified um, resting, uh, resting place and one that I think is, is important. We worked with churches, with humanist society, um, with funeral directors and with others to ensure that at every stage privacy was maintained. Um, so from the moment um, that the funeral director would bring the body to the site, um, it is under cover. So they drive onto the site. 
Um, even the access that we had chosen is not publicly accessible, so it's not somewhere where you're going to have a lot of passing traffic. Um, and they would be able to enter the site. N the hearse would not be opened until it's inside a closed facility. So there's no kind of long angle lenses trying to pick up on the detail of all of this. And any transfer also happens within the facility and not outside, so there's no external view. Um, and again, we created space for those who would be there. Um, it's not a facility designed for families to visit, um, but we recognise that families may want to be reassured by um, their pastor or their minister or their priest being able to go along um, to the facility and reassure them about it. And so we've also provided a facility for them um, to be able to be at the facility and spend time in prayer and reflection um, and to be able to reassure then families that, that's, that, that that is dignified and, and proper, um, because we believe that that was important in terms of, of project dignity. It has been a huge effort. The, the, um, the contractors, um, Henry Brothers, um, went through CPD, obviously, but we're hoping that they will be able to maintain the facility. It would be our intention um, that we would keep the facility um, and that we would have it um, in the event that there were any future issues, either with a large number of excess deaths due to a pandemic or any other kind of incident. Um, and so it would take, I think, between um, 24 and 48 hours to stand up from, um, from closure. And it would be manned 24-7, so there would be at no point that the facility would be left without supervision once the first body had arrived, um, because it was important for us that that was the case. So there has been a huge amount of work has gone into it, a huge amount of thought. And I have to say the officials in the department have been extraordinary. Um, in terms of turning it round um, from, as I say, what were essentially empty industrial sheds um, to what is a, a really immaculate facility um, and one that I think in many ways um, kind of gold standard for how you would produce something like this in that turnaround time. Um, but as I say, impressive though it is, and I've visited it, it is also very sobering. Um, when you stand in those areas to see the scale of what we were planning for. Um, and it's also, I hope, something that we never have to use for that very reason. And if I could just say, Minister, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and it's really important that we get detail like that, because I don't think people realise the amount of effort has been put in and what we really were expecting. So when we have this conversation about unlock, that's the sobering thought, to have those details of what you did and, uh, and what your department did. Um, uh, and the coordination and the cooperation, I thought, was exceptional. And, uh, and there was a piece about the, the military in there. And, and the point that, that needs to be made is that the military can be used in the most discreet manner, but have a really big impact. Uh, and this is it. And, and even with the NIGSU, who can help as well, or the military uh, assistance teams, who help with that as well. So I, I, I think it's important that people do know the level of work that yeah. you've, you've done in, in regards to that, and I commend and, you and, all and for it. And importantly, also, the sensitivity around that, because we do recognise that for some in our, in our community, the involvement of the military is still an issue of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And so the ministry, I mean, to be fair, the military are also aware of that, and therefore the site that they've given us is self-contained, it's not branded, it's completely civilly managed, um, and they were really conscious of their wish to ensure that anyone who would use that site and that facility would feel comfortable and confident about using it. And so I have to pay tribute to them for the help that they gave us. It, it, was, it, is, it is the perfect place for such a facility if if that's a word you can use in yeah. that context, but it is the perfect place. And, 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 I, and I know the place very well indeed. Um, so can I very, very briefly move on to, to, to legacy? Um, and I know we're short on time, and, and it's a very general question, I guess. But we know that we've moved slightly, or certainly the NIO has moved slightly in regards to legacy. Um, and I think all parties have been briefed on what they're planning in regards to legacy. Um, uh, and their proposals for that. Do you have a view on that at this moment in time, or where do we see us going in regards to legacy? I know it's not yours. I know it sits with the NIO. I know this is being debated in Westminster. But it's just your view on, on their new plan for legacy. 
Well, I think the first thing I would say is that you're being incredibly diplomatic to say that they've moved slightly. Um, I would say that they have um, moved quite some distance from what was originally anticipated and at um, the very last possible moment. Yes, I do have a view. I have a party political view um, that I don't particularly believe um, that the current arrangements that they're proposing are appropriate. But I also have a view with respect to the Justice Department, because obviously we had been preparing for the HIU um, over an extended period of time. Preparatory work had been ongoing with the Northern Ireland Office officials. Um, and it had been the expectation that the Department of Justice um, would be responsible for ensuring that that um, was operationalised. Um, the new structures which have been um, proposed, which are more akin to a kind of truth commission structure, um, I have issues from a justice perspective as to whether or not they are Article 2 compliant. I think that's doubtful. I have issues. Um, around the balance that has been struck between truth recovery and justice. Um, and I think that the emphasis seems to be on truth recovery as opposed to justice um, in the new package. Um, and I, I think, therefore, that there's a question mark as to whether it should, in fact, be the Justice Department that we take that forward. And I've communicated um, concerns in that respect um, to the Northern Ireland Office and to the Secretary of State. Um, and we'll be discussing that in due course um, with executive colleagues. Um, and there is also, I think, a wider issue about the understanding. I think that there are elements of the package as currently proposed um, which are unrealistic in terms of um, what's being proposed. Had there been better engagement with my officials about the change of direction, it may be that we would have been better positioned to inform um, the NIO about the challenges that those changes present um, and some of the difficulties around that. Um, but we didn't have that opportunity um, to be able to inform that. Um, but we continue to engage with the NIO and with officials um, as best we can. But at this stage, I would have to say that we are in a listening mode um, as opposed to an engagement mode because we're no longer clear um, as to the department's role. Um, in this particular structure. Um, and I think that there are wider questions that will need to be answered about that by the Northern Ireland Office in due course. And that's a, and that's a fair answer, uh, Minister. I mean, you know and that, that we're opposed to the Stormont House Agreement. And, and I mean, there's no point having a discussion about that here now. But, and certainly these new proposals that are brought forward have got huge issues with it. But, but they really are uh, a set of bones. And there's not much flesh on those bones at this minute in time. And a lot of the questions we've asked have not been answered. And we haven't got clarity. And, and if you haven't got clarity, we certainly haven't got clarity. So I mean, I suppose just to follow up, I mean, do we have any idea whenever we're going to get the opportunity as uh, with yourselves and political parties to get together to start talking about this and thrashing it out and get a better understanding of what they're proposing? Well, it's my understanding from the Secretary of State that intensive negotiations are currently ongoing with all the Northern Ireland parties. Okay. I can be diplomatic too when required. Yeah, right, okay, so, so uh, we've had one phone call. Um, so I wouldn't call that intense. Um, uh, if others have had more phone calls, that's up to them. But, but I, I think we've had to one to arrange the second. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so I, I think to do justice to, to the intensity of the engagement, that probably reflects it. Um, it is, I mean, look, at the end of the day, this is an NIO. It's a Westminster issue. Of course it is, yeah. And so there are limitations. However, I think as everyone in Northern Ireland would agree, how we handle legacy is absolutely crucial in terms of how we build for the future. And a failure to deal with this appropriately through the mechanisms that are brought forward does create implications for policing in the current context. It creates challenges because things like um, legacy litigation and other measures will impact on the on current policing. The Police Ombudsman's Office is also affected by the lack of appropriate structures um, to be able to deal with historic and, and legacy policing issues and so on. So I think it's in all of our interest to, to get a comprehensive package <clears> in place. And whilst we may have disagreements um, around what that exactly would look like, and Stormont House was not perfect, um, I do think it was our best opportunity um, to be able to get a comprehensive pro process in place. I don't see what has been brought forward as being comprehensive, nor frankly do I see it as compliant either with Stormont House or with the New Decade New Approach Agreement. Um, and that it isn't consistent with what was what, with what was to be done. 
Whether it's better or worse, well, I would argue that the fact that it was conceived of um, in isolation rather than with five parties in negotiations um, and has buy-in at the moment, it would appear from none of them, would make it considerably worse than Stormont House, which was not, I don't think anyone championed it, but I think all of us could have just about lived with it. And perhaps that's the highest bar we could have set um, for this. At the moment, I don't see the, the alternative, which seems to have been conceived, as I say, in a, in a few weeks as really having the same depth. But look, at the end of the day, we need to deal with this. So when it comes in front of me and when it comes to our officials, we will continue to engage. But we will not take responsibility for bad decision making elsewhere. Um, and we will certainly not be fleshing out the bones, as you put it, um, if the structure, if the skeleton itself um, isn't functional. Um, and we'll not be taking um, responsibility for fleshing it out and covering a damaged skeleton. So um, it's incumbent on the NIO um, and on the, um, on the minister um, to, to get this right um, and ensure that whatever engagement the executive has with them um, isn't to repair damage that's already been done, um, but actually to implement something that is workable and acceptable and functional. Yeah. And we can't have justice going into, or even legacy going into a holding pattern uh, and allowing COVID-19 to be a smokescreen. Uh, I mean, we need to talk about it. And, and where I absolutely disagree in the Stormont House Agreement, which we think is, is completely unworkable, and we cannot ignore the thousands of people who are injured during the troubles, and that's what it pretty much does. Um, uh, I think we really do need to dig into the new proposals to see what they are trying to do. And, and if, if they are going to bring in new proposals, if they're not better, then, then there's no point having them. But uh, thank you for your answer, Minister. Yeah, thank you. Rachel, you have three questions here, one on staffing in the department, uh, stalking and asylum seekers. So if you want to put them. That's me. Yeah, I'll just take them in order, just in terms of um, a, an update on, I appreciate you've been over um, the DOJ update internally, but if the amount of staff affected and um, also you've touched upon in terms of the IT equipment being made available, are all staff working from home that should be working from home? Um, I think in terms of staff working from home, we have about 80 per cent of staff here working. Not all of our staff can work from home. Also, not all of our staff can come into the office. So, like most businesses, we have a certain number of people who are at home but not working at home. But it's a relatively small number. So, 80 per cent of our staff are working. Um, we are able to support work from home as far as is possible. Where people are working in the office, social distancing um, is being um, is being used, and where we need to, we are implementing a rota system, so that people um, we keep the number of people in the offices um, to a minimum um, on any individual day, and that is allowing us to continue um, with the work that we are doing to actually deliver. Um, on key elements of the justice system. So, from my perspective, I'm confident that we are managing, in terms of the internal stuff, um, that we're managing that well. Um, and as I say, we have 80% of our staff um, regularly working on site um, or at home, and that seems to have worked. And IT, um, as you'll recognise in justice, there are elements of that that's not possible for home working because of security concerns. Um, but where it is possible, that has been implemented. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a num number, one on the, the stalking legislation. I believe re re this was raised on Tuesday um, with the domestic abuse legislation. But in terms of the introduction of stalking legislation by um, yourselves at the department, has this been affected by COVID-19? And are you on track that this would be introduced in the autumn, as has been previously stated? Yes. I am. Um, the autumn is still the target date. Um, we got executive approval um, on the 8th of April to be able to go ahead and draft the stalking legislation. Drafting instructions are being finalised with the Departmental Solicitor's Office um, at the moment to get legal resources for that, and we're hoping that we can start to draft the bill within the next month, um, and hopefully then we'll be back um, in the autumn. So minimal delay in terms of time scale. Um, in fact, I would be hopeful of no delay if we can get to that stage. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'm sure a lot of other people um, do. Finally, um, and I'm aware that the Home Office is the responsible department for um, administering information, guidance and finance um, on people who are asylum seekers in Northern Ireland, certainly the Bryson ministers um, adhere in, in, in Northern Ireland, but you'd be aware the um, 
recent reports and ongoing issues with um, asylum seekers and they're having to, you know, obviously no recourse to public funds and relying on charities and food banks to, banks to get by. Um, but in terms of justice, legal aid is provided by the department, and as we know, the legal aid bill at the moment has reduced, which is a lack um, or the less cases coming forward. So I'm just wondering, um, has there been any engagement between yourself and the Department of Justice with the Home Office and the uh, Department for Communities regarding the condition and situation of asylum seekers, and if any have been affected by the pandemic from a legal point of view? There has been no engagement with the Home Office specifically um, on those um, seeking asylum because those cases at the moment are not progressing through the system as things stand. Um, so we haven't had to have engagement on that issue. Um, Minister for Communities would be the one who would take up the, <clears throat> the kind of wider support issues um, around that. And I, I honestly couldn't say whether or not Deirdre has had those conversations uh, with the Home Office, but I do know that all ministers have been attending regularly. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, um, the, the um, online calls um, with um, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who has been coordinating the kind of UK-wide response, and we have had the opportunity um, to raise issues, whether it be around asylum, whether it be around um, justice issues or whatever, and communities have been attending those meetings as well and been able to engage in that. Um, but it would really be for the Minister for Communities to confirm whether or not the issue of asylum and support for asylum seekers has been raised. The issue in justice terms, I suppose, is more for those who would be held within the justice system who are foreign nationals and who might be subject to deportation after um, their release. And so, obviously, because people have nowhere to go um, at, at that point, um, there is an issue there. It's one of the reasons why they were excluded from the early release scheme, because they wouldn't be able to travel um, back to the place where, where they live. Um, and if they were going to be deported as part of, of the, the structures around that, we didn't want to leave people um, early in that situation without the right support. Um, but I think the Department for Communities could probably keep you right in terms of support for asylum seekers. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Paul, similar to my questions, but I'll let you take them around the general flow of business within the department. Yeah, I suppose my question, and I will be brief, Minister, is, uh, is there any business within the justice field that has stopped any operation or any theme, uh, or even reprioritised to the point where it's just treading water? Um, I think we have had to manage um, a number of the streams that we would have had, um, but I, I don't think anything has stopped. Um, certainly, some things will be moving more slowly than would otherwise have been the case, but the things that would be front-facing, so the things that are most likely to impact on members of the public, so the legislation that we're bringing forward, um, things like um, ensuring that access NI checks and so on are able to continue. All of those things that are front-facing are continuing um, in terms of the department. Obviously, you're aware of the decisions that have been made by the Lord Chief Justice's office with respect to the courts, um, and they're obviously looking at that specifically at the minute. And that has implications in terms of again, you know, um, front-facing issues. But again, they have a very clear um, prioritisation of the decision making in that respect as to what they are taking forward and what they are adjourning as a temporary measure. But no, I mean, nothing has stopped, but some things have slowed. Can I, can I ask you about specific issues around maybe probation board or maybe youth justice agencies' work that may well have needed people to enter people's homes? Yep. Or? Um, in terms of probation board, probation board are not carrying out home visits at the moment, but they are continuing using technology and phones um, to continue to maintain contact with those who are, um, who are under their supervision. Um, and the majority of work that they would be doing, um, they're not operating again in the prisons for reasons of not wanting to be breaching the kind of cordon sanitaire that we have kind of established around the prison system. Um, but they are again able to engage via technology and other things. So again, even within the Youth Justice Agency, most of our people are working, um, but they may be doing slightly different things or doing things in a slightly different way. Um, but they're continuing to look after the young people who are in our care. When it comes to things like the secure facility at uh, Woodlands, um, that is, um, there are a smaller number of young people um, in that facility. Um, social distancing is being managed and the supervision of that is continuing. Um, and so far, things have been progressing um, satisfactorily in that respect. So 
again, it's not something that we have stopped. So probation board haven't stopped working, um, but they are working differently. Um, but they're continuing to ensure that public safety, um, particularly for those who would be more high risk individuals, the public safety is the priority when it comes to how they use the resources and how they interact um, in the work that they do. And by way of appreciation and acknowledgement, Minister, can I just say that we had a meeting here one Monday, I think it was the 23rd of March, a month ago now, and it was a very surreal meeting. Um, Deborah maybe was there. If she wasn't there at that time, she was there the previous and, and straight after. But you could see clearly on the faces of the officials the fatigue, the concern, the worry and the fear on the faces. And I, I certainly, it's a meeting I won't forget, but I suppose by way of my commentary is just to pass on our appreciation of all the hard work that has been put in by the, the department over the last number of weeks. Um, you know, they, they have had to step up again and they've done that admirably and we thank them for that. Can I, can I concur with that without, yeah. without dwelling on it so that we can keep the time moving? Yeah. Paul, I'm sure, speaks for all of us and the Minister included in respect of that commendation. And, and if we have time, we may just, make a Just one other comment. thing to bear in mind also that a number of our people have also moved to the centre um, in order to help with the operations there. Um, so once we had the department um, in order to run uh, smoothly, um, some of those people, including um, including permanent secretary, but also including some other members of staff, have taken up roles part-time, if you like, in the centre um, to support the efforts there. And I think that's been very helpful. Um, they're very strategic, very well organised. I have to say I'm very proud of the department and the way they've responded. I think one, one question I had on this was, at what point does the department need to, and use ministers, start reconfigurating your, your planning assumptions? And that will also have an impact on the budget required for the department. Um, I, it's where, what, what stage are you at in terms of those considerations? Well, in terms of uh, reconfiguring the plan, um, as I said, we are at the early stages now of those conversations around justice recovery. Um, there will be some things that we had hoped to do that may not be able to be done within this year or indeed within this mandate, and we will need to look at that very carefully in terms of prioritising which elements that will be. It's hard to predict exactly which those will be at this stage because things are still very much in flux. We also don't know what the future will look like either. We could be in and out of this kind of arrangement working, so we, we need to think quite carefully about how we're going to manage that as well. In terms of finance, I think there are two things. I mean, first of all, you'll notice in terms of the bids that we've put in, um, they are relatively modest in comparison to our needs um, in terms of what we've asked for. But we are conscious that there is no point in us going to the Department of Finance on a regular basis um, asking for additional resources um, if we aren't confident that we can spend all the resources that we have at the moment. So we are conscious that it's, there's a responsibility on us and the Finance Minister has encouraged us to look at areas where we think we may not spend all of our resources in one place. Are there ways that we can use that resource then to be able to reconfigure services elsewhere? And so the Department is already looking at that very carefully. Um, where we have had, I think, particularly unusual expenditure. So um, there are elements um, around policing, there are elements around the uh, resting place, um, and there were also some other elements that we had put bids in for that were successful. So we're working well, I think, with the Department of Finance to try to make sure um, that the money that has been allocated to the department is properly spent, and where we believe it's not going to be used uh, where it's able to be surrendered early in the cycle, um, so that if there are needs in other places, that that can be addressed. I don't think there will be a huge amount of money being surrendered from the Department of Justice. Uh, we had quite tight constraints um, within the financial um, settlement that we had, only 2.5% uplift real realistically uh, when you take the policing out of the equation, um, and relatively small budgets with which we're expected to do quite a lot. Um, but I expect that you're correct that we may be reconfiguring what we do as opposed um, to, to anything else. There will be some areas where we underspend, but there will also be additional costs, um, and we need to also plan for that because there will be areas where, in order to recover, we will need to spend more initially to get things back um, to where we need to be. One of the interesting parts of the recovery, I think, is what learning we can take forward from the pandemic itself and from the crisis in terms of, for example, use of technology um, and remote working um, in order to actually look at are there opportunities for us to do things differently on a more permanent basis. 
Um, that won't necessarily mean um, that we do them as we've been doing them during the pandemic. But I think there's huge learning um, in terms of, for example, speeding up justice and that piece of work that we were doing around what we've been able to achieve in a relatively short space of time in a crisis. And I think we can learn from that in terms of what we can achieve in the longer term in response to the normal business pressures that we face. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, I'm glad to hear you that last statement because that's what I've been saying at every opportunity. I do think we need to learn from this and, and all of the things that we've been told for years that can't be done and can't be done and can't be done we suddenly realise they can be done. So I do think there needs to be a change and, 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 and I know that the Chief Constable is actually looking at that in terms of, and had already been looking yes. at it but I do think it's an, it is very important to look at different ways of working to allow people who have care and responsibilities to be able to work to be able to ha play their part in whatever role that is, and if that means working from home, I, I think that, that that needs to be looked at. I don't think we should be punishing the 98% who will do the job no matter where they are for the 2% that will not do it no matter where they are. My experience, for what it's worth, is that when people are working from home, they often work more efficiently and effectively, um, because you find that their travel much. to work time um, and the water cooler moments, if you like, mm -hmm. um, are reduced dramatically. But there are consequences of people not being able to collaborate in one place. So it's about striking a balance. It's not about everybody working from home permanently, but perhaps looking at people who would find it convenient to work from home more regularly, um, but still be able to come in when the pandemic is over and attend meetings and workshops and things like that. So the flexibility, I think, that it gives us is hugely important, and that's something that we need to look at. But I think contact in the workplace is also important. So it's about striking that balance. No, I, I, I do agree with you. I think it's, it's very important. My, my question actually is in relation to, and, and that's more, I suppose, a comment than a question, to be fair, is on the legacy stuff, um, as Doug has raised it. And I agree with you, you know, to say that it has um, slightly moved. It, it, it doesn't reflect in any shape or form anything that was agreed. I'm actually even wonder what is the value of the NAO having any kind of negotiations with the five parties that did that. The five parties signed up to the Stormont House Agreement. We were at a point where we were supposed to be delivering on the Stormont House Agreement and over 17,000 responses went into the consultation on the HIU draft legislation. So for me, I actually just think the NIO and the British Government just took everything that was done here for years by all of the parties, by all of the victims' groups, by all of the victims, by everybody that worked really hard to try to deliver, threw it in the bin and said, we're going to do what we fancy doing anyway. I don't know the value of having any negotiations with people who are going to do that at the end of it. So um, I'm sure you can sense I'm not very happy about the situation. I really am angry. I think that it's, it, it's not about me. I'm not a victim. It's not about me. It's about the people who I've had to deal with over the years, who I encouraged, who I, in some cases, convinced to be to take part in that consultation response because I felt that their voices needed to be heard and I did it on the basis that I was telling them that this if you don't take part in that consultation response your voice won't be heard and this won't deliver for you it's not delivering for them anyway so well, there was matter. no meaningful engagement with officials about the change in direction um, and I've made my displeasure clear about that because there will have been nugatory work done in the department <laughs> as a result of that um, which you know we're unclear about the extent of that um, and yes, it's disappointing. I agree with you. There was a consultation process. Um, we then had the, we then had the new decade, new approach, um, to now use the consultation as a rationale for changing what was agreed after the consultation makes no logical sense to me whatsoever. But then, so much doesn't um, these days that I, I've kind of taken that as read. Um, but yes, I mean there are still Article Two requirements to mm -hmm. fulfil. Um, so we'll continue to explore how the government intend to do that, um, and we will try to play a constructive role in shaping that. But as I say, we will not take responsibility for a policy that we weren't involved in, in, in the conception of, because it is a change in direction that we weren't consulted about and had no influence over. Would the minister, just in, in relation to that, then consider, um, or at least look at the level of funding that the police ombudsman's office is getting, because. Obviously, f families will now say that as their only means of getting any type of, of answers or real possibility of justice. And we are going to ha now have numerous cases that we're probably holding back in the hope that they could be dealt with through the HAU 
that are going to end up in the courts and all of the issues that you've already raised about the implications for the PSNA current day placing around that which is one of my biggest concerns because I think it's one of the biggest um, those barriers to people from nationalist republican communities applying to join the PSNA is this issue around legacy so for me it, 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 is, a, it is a massive issue but just around that specific around the looking at the level of funding for the the police ombudsman's office. The difficulty with this has always been, and it's true of the Stormont House Agreement in the HIU, that the funding that was made available um, under New Decade, New Approach was for the HIU, but not for wider mm -hmm. legacy issues. So, for example, um, the funding for um, things <coughs> like inquests and so on, th those are very discrete packages. There has been, there was a commitment to fund the HIU, um, I think, of the 400 the 400, 300 to 400 million that was going to be required over 10 years, the UK government had committed about 250 um, of that. Um, but the problem that we have is that none of that can be drawn down until the HIU is in place. Now that the HIU looks like it may never be in place, we don't know what the status of the funding that goes with it is. So the reality is that what we are funding now is coming out of our existing budgets, and that will continue to be the case. And it is hugely frustrating because, as, you well, as you're well aware, um, <clears throat> the police and how they respond to legacy cases and investigate legacy cases then has implications for how people view the PSNI. Um, even though they weren't involved in the original case, um, it can have an impact on how people view them and the levels of trust. The Ombudsman's Office has the current complaints to deal with for, for the police and in terms of the work that they do. But they also have this legacy piece of work, uh, which again is taking resources directly away from the current situation. Um, Operation Canova has been effective in terms of building confidence with people who wanted those investigations completed. But again, there, we know that that has, if you like, reached um, the, the limitations in terms of capacity um, for investigative officers and so on to be able to, to continue. Um, so there are restrictions around all of this that in reality will not be resolved unless additional money is brought forward and we're not clear what the funding package that would go with these new measures would look like, how it would be spent, who would administer it or any of that and whether any of it would come towards um, the work that is already ongoing seems unlikely, if I'm going to be honest, because to date it hasn't. So for example, the police have to fund um, legacy litigation out of their current budgets, as you as you well know, and so the money that they're spending on those issues is being taken away from frontline policing, and that has consequences for how communities see the police operating in their own community day by day in in the current crisis. And this tension between police in the past and police in the present um, has been one that from was one of the drivers for me in terms of trying to get some kind of comprehensive approach to dealing with the past, because I believe that unless we have a piece of legacy work that is separate, separately funded, separately managed, um, and that addresses the Article 2 compliance issues, but also addresses the needs of victims to be able to get justice um, in the here and now, um, we will not allow the police and free up the police the policing board, the police ombudsman and so on, to be able to police the present in the way that they would want to do, um, unfettered by what has happened in the past. And I think that the consequences of not getting this right are significant for current policing. And I've been very clear with the Northern Ireland office that that is my view. Um, and I think it's important that they understand the consequences of not getting something operationally um, delivered to address legacy issues and the, the pressure that that will consequently put on other parts of the justice system. Well, that usefully pivots us into the next question where Doug was asking about the legacy inquest branch, I think, in the PSNI and the announcement about that re-engagement. So if you want to cover the, there was a stat, just a purely statistical question on staffing levels in the police. We'd yes. got that previously. If you can update the committee on that, and then that will allow us to, to go into Doug's question. Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of um, this year, so as of the 1st of April, um, there are 6,903 police officers uh, full time and 2,368 um, police staff. And over 90% of police officers, excluding part time reserve, um, and over 85% of police staff remain available for work. So that's the, that's the, the latest statistics that we have been able to get um, from the PSNI. 
Um, there were um, issues, as you know, around particular pressures that might emerge in terms of policing. And the Chief Constable worked with the senior team and they put together a series of potential actions that would mitigate any shortage of officers um, due to illness and address any pressures. So um, they basically put all PSNI officers on a state of readiness for duty. Um, they halted the push to cut overtime working, which you know has been ongoing for some time. Um, they cancelled routine rest days. Um, that was one of the options that they had in their, their, their armoury. Um, they also the changing of routine shift patterns to 12-hour shifts, um, considering delaying retirement um, of senior officers and also putting in place contingency plans in case there were high numbers who had to stay at home um, and, but might be other, able to do other background work um, that would free up officers for front line. Um, so there are more limitations in terms of how we expand capacity in Northern Ireland than would be the case in some other places, um, but those measures were put in place. In addition, you're aware um, that the Chief Constable, unlike in the rest um, of the UK, it can't vary the length of time it takes to train as a police constable. Um, that was in the legislation, and so um, he approached me and we brought forward emergency regulations to allow him to reduce the number of training days um, undertaken by PSNI trainees, and they could then attest trainees earlier if they were suitable um, to serve as constables. Now, they haven't used that um, facility, but we felt it was important to prepare for that. Um, and that will then um, that will give us a, that will essentially that will um, that will end after this current pandemic. So it's a time limited facility, but it does give the chief constable the same flexibility that um, forces in the rest of the UK would have had. And, and, and minister, I mean, all of this was to create masks for, for, for dealing with COVID-19, and we haven't had to use some of it. And in fact, I believe the LIB, which was stopped, yeah. um, is now been reconstituted again, has now gone back onto their, um, their, their, their caseload once more. Does that mean that the pressures have eased on the PSNI? Um, I think what it shows is that the good management um, and the quick action that um, the Chief Constable has taken and the fact that people have complied with the regulations um, and have worked hard to ensure that the Health Department and others haven't been under pressure um, has meant that the PSNI haven't faced the kind of levels of sickness that might have been expected in terms of if the virus had spread more widely in society. And so having discussed um, with me uh, before doing so about the, the potential of doing this, the Chief Constable um, said that he was keen to try to take up pieces of work that were important in terms of public confidence but that might otherwise be delayed. And so he felt that it was important that the legacy investigation branch were able to restart. Um, unfortunately, the same isn't possible um, for the police ombudsman's office simply because of the restrictions on their office. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate for them to be back in the office um, because of social distancing challenges and so on in that space. Um, and it would be much more difficult, I think, for them to, to restart um, their work on that regard. Um, but the police feel that they can, um, and that was the decision of the Chief Constable. Again, it's an operational decision, but it's one that I think um, shows that there is a sensitivity there um, to the impact that all of this has on victims who have maybe been waiting for an extraordinary length of time for justice um, and will be, I think, relieved that the police are back um, actually starting to deal with those cases. Thank you. Um, similarly, then, on the prison service to do with staffing levels, just a statistical update on that, um, and that will allow Paul to come in. He had asked a question about um, prison staff and what protection measures are in place. Obviously, there was good information at the start that you gave us around that, but if you could just provide us with stats on the, the staff and then, Paul. Yeah. Um, at the minute, staffing levels are stable um, across all of the establishments. Um, additional overtime payments are in place for operational staff um, where needed um, in order to ensure that we have regime operating in the prisons. Around 15 per cent of um, staff are absent at present. About half of those are COVID-related absences. Some would be self-isolating. Um, others would be um, have family members with vulnerabilities or have vulnerabilities themselves. But that 15 per cent total, um, as I say, is total absences, so that would include normal sickness and other things, other absence from work, um, and about half would be due to COVID-19 related issues. I think that's an improving picture, 
It is. I mean, it fluctuates, I have to say, week by week, um, in the same way that the number of prisoners self-isolating fluctuates week by week. Um, but it is an improving picture, and I have to say that the work that prison service have done um, is to be commended. I mean, I think anyone who's following what has happened in um, England and Wales with respect to prisons uh, will see that there is a stark contrast um, between how the disease has mapped out um, in prisons and other places and how it has happened here. We took some quite difficult and potentially very controversial decisions quite early on around reducing the prison population um, and also um, around paying additional overtime to staff who could make themselves available more. Um, but I think that all of those decisions that have been taken, the ending of visitations and so on, have actually been crucial in protecting people in the prison system and been effective in doing so. Um, hasn't been an easy thing to do, but I think the Director General um, has shown real foresight um, in terms of the leadership he's shown around this. So I think uh, prison, <coughs> I have to say prison service is often overlooked um, as one of the services, the key services in justice, um, and they absolutely shouldn't be because how they've handled this pandemic, given the complexities of the job that they do on a day-to-day -day basis, it is pretty remarkable. Just. Uh to add to that, Minister, yeah, the leadership shown in our prison service now compared to four years ago, uh, five years ago, is is stark, is completely changed. Uh, so we welcome that. It's a very good news story, and we applaud the actions of our prison service staff and the leadership shown. Uh, can I ask, is there any uh, positive cases in any of our prisons Sorry? or holding centres? Any positive cases of COVID-19 in any of our establishments? There are no um, prisoners who have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, there are, I think, five prison officers who have tested positive. Um, but obviously, um, for some of them, they tested positive after a period of absence from the facilities. Um, but yeah, the, there have been no prisoners who have tested positive. Um, obviously, very difficult time for those officers who have tested positive. Um, but again, they now have access to testing in the prison uh, system for the staff and for their families. Um, so if they're symptomatic, um, they can follow the PHA guidance and that's now in place so that they're able as frontline workers to be able to be tested. You've, you've framed up my second question, which is around standard operating procedures if, uh, when staff need tested or fall ill. Uh, and then, of course, uh, inmates fall ill. Uh, I, I take it there's a, a policy in place? Yeah, um, first of all, um, just to suppose to set out some of the things that have been done, um, first of all, in terms of trying to protect against the virus getting into the prison system, um, we have changed the way the prisons are run. So we have introduced a restricted house based regime. We have introduced um, social distancing measures, and you'll understand if you've been inside the prison. That can be challenging, um, but we have tried to do that in a proportionate way. Um, there's been a restriction on movement between and access to prison establishments, so only essential staff, so for example, I mentioned probation and so on, don't now come into the prisons um, in order to, to do that. We've also been involved <clears throat> in shielding older and vulnerable prisoners, um, and that has been taking place. Anyone who is symptomatic, um, will be in isolation and we have an isolation facility in each of the establishments um, and also 14 days of self-isolation for all new committals so anyone coming into the system um, will have to do that we've also because of the changes that we have made and also the natural number of people being released over time and um, being able to significant redu significantly reduce the number of people doubling up and sharing sales which is obviously important. We stopped face-to-face -face visits um, in the 23rd of March, and on the 30th of March, uh, we were able to introduce virtual visits. Um, we have also suspended temporary release and working in the community schemes because actually temporary release itself would be problematic in that anyone coming back in. So, for example, compassionate relief still continues, but temporary release doesn't. But anyone who goes on compassionate relief now, it is explained to them that if they are to come back, they will have to self-isolate for 14 days when they return to prison, um, just to be sure that they are um, COVID-19 free before they re-enter the population. Um, also, the temporary early release scheme, um, about 120 people have been released <laughs> under that scheme to date. Uh, we closed the learning and skills units, um, because again, that would have involved bringing people in from outside. 
Um, we have increased allowances, television access and telephone credits in order to try and ensure the prisoners are kept occupied, um, given that some of the other things that they would have been doing have been removed. Uh, we have increased cleaning of the prisons dramatically, and we're using PPE in line with WHO and PHA guidance. Um, also, we're testing symptomatic prisoners and also the staff and family members in line with the criteria from PHA. So I think in combination, all of those um, I think have been quite effective in terms of being able to control um, the spread. And in terms of the, how that's worked, one of the key things was communication, which we discussed earlier in terms of the wider population. But um, the Director General um, wrote to the prisoners before. Um, we made those changes and informed them um, that the changes would be happening and why. Um, and they broadly have been supportive of what's been happening. And um, I think Jackie Durkin, as uh, the Chief Inspector for the Criminal Justice Inspectorate, visited both McGabry and Hyde Bank Wood and was very positive about the relationships and the stability. Um, that was that was being um, implemented, and also the fact that things like virtual visits um, had really helped in terms of supporting families outside the prisons. I would have quite a bit of contact with families who would write to me um, around concerns that they might have about um, their family member who's in, in custody. Um, and when we do that, the prison service have been fantastic, um, literally immediately going back and having a chat with them and checking on them, making sure that everything's OK. And it's been very reassuring, I think, for families to know, um, because we recognise this is a stressful time for everybody, but it's particularly stressful um, when you don't have that ongoing contact with family. And we're all experiencing a little bit of what it's like not to be able to be face to face with our families at the moment. Um, but when you've been doing that for a long period of time, it can be very, very stressful. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask for on the 120 or so that have been released, is that the, the specific figure and has there been any compliance issues? Yeah, I think at the minute um, it's, 100, it's 119, 120 maybe today, so there may have been, um, it wasn't all in one go, it was, it was over a period of time obviously. Um, there have been a number, a small number, um, I think when I checked last, eight prisoners had been returned to custody. Um, out of that 120 as a result of not complying with the regulations um, and the conditions of, um, of the release. But they are all being managed in the community. The police are aware of them. They know where they've been released to. Um, and there is, in the majority of cases, absolutely no um, challenge or problem at all. Um, as I say, we put a lot of <coughs> pictures in place to make sure that the people that we were releasing were the lowest risk of reoffending. But you'll understand that even in that case, some people will reoffend, and I think the majority of those who have been returned to custody it was as a result of alcohol or drugs, which is not surprising given the degree um, of um, addiction um, that we know exists within the prisoner population. Um, but it's it's very very difficult, I think, because. Um, it's how you manage that when the health service and everyone else is so stretched um, at home. So we tried to avoid releasing people who had current issues, mm. but obviously people who had historic issues, um, that might have been an issue for them. So to, just again, for some clarity, those eight returned, it was in respect of an offence, uh, uh, an offence no, not complying, not in all cases. Okay. Um, for most, it would have been not complying with the terms of their release. So part of the terms of the release um, involved them uh, ob observing a curfew, having no contact with their victim, um, in some cases not going outside a certain limit um, where they were, um, a, a bit the way they would on bail conditions, only slightly different, um, and also no alcohol, no drugs. Um, so some of them might have come to the attention of the police because maybe they were drunk and disorderly, so that would have brought them to the attention of the police. Others might just have been drunk and, and seen, but because they don't have to commit an offence, so they don't have to go through the court system to be returned because it's under prison rules and um, they can simply be returned at the request of the governor. Um, so it's quite a, it's, it's an efficient system um, to deal with people who breach the rules. Um, but not all of them would have committed an additional offence. Some of them may have, um, but obviously none of those would have gone through the system. So we wouldn't be able to say whether they were, they were guilty as charged. Mm -hmm. If there are additional offences arising from it, those will go through the normal procedures um, down the line. But being suspected of having committed an offence or found, for example, 
intoxicated would be sufficient to have you returned to prison um, under the rules under which they were released. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Emma wants to come in, and, and Doug had a question as well. So I'll bring Emma in, and then Doug had a question on the military assistance team visit around contingency planning. So Emma, and then Doug. Thanks very much for your answers so far. I just have a question around the temporary release as well. Um, there's 120 released. Is that so far? Do you plan on extending that? To yeah, we, it's it's a rolling program. So essentially, um, we will we will continue to assess the need um, in terms of the the numbers of prison officers versus the numbers um, of prisoners, the impact on things like. Um, uh, doubling up in sales and so on, and we'll make those decisions as we go. So it's not it's not a final number. Okay. I think in total we originally identified for the first tranche of prisoners. So in that first period, we had identified around 190 prisoners who qualified. In the end, only about 140 uh, wanted to take it up for different reasons. Some themselves were self isolating in the prison because they had symptoms. Others that family members who were self isolating who didn't want them coming home and catching um, COVID-19, and so there were, there was a, a more limited number. Others weren't able to um, secure accommodation, so where some had, we we're checking, obviously, that they have somewhere yeah. to go, um, because we don't want to create further pressure in the housing um, situation. But those who were able to get secured accommodation and were able to be released, we were able to kind of do that. But that's why the number has been increasing quite gradually, yeah. rather than just as one kind of major release. Yeah. No, that's all I had to ask. Thank sure. you. Thanks, Emma. Doug. Um, thank you. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going slightly off piste from the question. Yeah, no, that's okay. That answer. Um, but, but, Minister, I mean, we had a really good debate on, on Tuesday about um, domestic violence, and it just shows you that even though COVID 19 is going on, there's lots of other issues. And I thought it was a really, really um, good, good debate and, and things that we do need to, to, to look at. Um, and you know my background, um, uh, and I'm an outputs orientated, mission orientated person, uh, and the, the, those the most important part to do that is is my is people, uh, and if we don't look after our people, then there's something wrong. And if I found that my people were not being looked after properly, then uh, I would be standing screaming from the rafters. Um, uh, and, and when I come to the prison service, and I and I hear first of all that we've got no um, cases of prisoners who have got COVID-19, I think that's absolutely exceptional, really exceptional, um, and that needs to be shouted from the rafters. But I've got to ask you a question as a minister. If you were to find out that one of your five staff who got COVID-19, having come back from having COVID-19, got a written warning, what would your response be? Well, I think it's very clear that if someone has had an illness, um, and I mean, I obviously don't micromanage the employment of prison officers, but I think if someone has had an illness and a good reason to be absent from work because of that illness, um, it would be appropriate. Um, for them to be penalised for that. But obviously I can't comment on individual cases. I can't comment on specific circumstances. And it wouldn't be appropriate um, for me to do so. But COVID-19 and illness with COVID-19, um, self-isolating because you have symptoms or because you're vulnerable or have a vulnerable family member are valid reasons for absence from work. And as I said, about 7% um, of our staff who are currently absent are, are, are doing so for that reason, um, and so it, it's a justifiable reason. But obviously, if there are other issues at play, I wouldn't be able to comment or, or know about those. Uh, absolutely. So, so that leads me on, um, Minister, because I have spoken to you, uh, I've spoken to the, D, the, the DG of the prison service, I've spoken to the head of the civil service, I've spoken to Sue Gray, I've spoken to employer relations from NI Civil Service, Human Resources, yeah. um, I've spoken to HR about this issue. Do you think it's appropriate that an individual who went off sick with stress was diagnosed by a, a clinical um, psychiatrist as having PTSD, who fought the illness, a debilitating illness, to get back to work, and he gets a written warning? Now, no, no matter which way you, no matter which way you cut that, no matter whether you say, "Well, we have to take it in the round," no. how can that be right if he has got a mental health illness and he fought to get back, and it was accepted by human resources that he did fight to get back, and yet he gets a written warning? I think it's 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 disgraceful. Um, I think if I was a head of the prison service, I would be screaming at these people right now. If I was a justice minister, I would be screaming at these people right now. Because here's what that has done. It has created mental health 
as a control measure to stop people going off work. That's what it's done, whether it's meant to or not. It is because now we have people who are scared to go off work with a mental health injury because they're scared of getting a written warning. It doesn't sit with you. It sits with the Department of Finance, but they're your people. They're the, they're, they're the prison service people. We need to be fighting on their behalf. Well, I think there's a couple of things I want to say to that. First of all, um, mental illness um, and ment poor mental health are no different to physical illness and poor physical health. And when it comes to absence from work, it should not be treated any differently. And I don't believe that I'm breaching any Northern Ireland civil service um, policies by saying that, nor should I be, because I believe fundamentally that if someone has a period of mental ill health, it is every bit as serious as a period of physical ill health. And it's very important um, that we recognise that as a serious issue. In terms of how individuals are managed within the prison service, as you know and, and recognise, it is a matter for the Department of Finance to look at, and it's something that they have to manage because they do apply it as the Kind of standard civil service approach uh, w when they come to these issues. But in terms of what I can do as Justice Minister um, in respect of these issues, we do provide additional support and counselling. It's one of the things that I've raised on every visit to prisons where I've spoken with officers. I've asked them, do they believe that there is sufficient um, counselling, that there is sufficient advice for them if they experience trauma? or if they um, themselves feel distressed or anxious or suffering from poor mental health. Um, and I have to say that some have said quite candidly that they find those kinds of services not particularly helpful in their circumstance, that they would rather talk to other people, mentors within the organisation who have personal experience um, of the job that they do and understand intimately what it is that, that, that it entails. Um, but yes, it is a stressful job to be a prison officer, and not just when COVID-19 is live, but all of the time. Some of the things that people will witness, I mean, those of you, I don't know how many of you watched the documentary, but um, those of you who watched the documentary Inside Hyde Bank Wood um, will have seen that you're dealing with people with high levels um, of mental health issues, of anxiety, of stress, um, of substance um, misuse um, and dependency and the levels, for example, of self-harming um, and so on um, can be significant. And prison officers have to walk into cells and they don't know when they open the door and what it's going to lie on the other side. And that can be an extremely stressful um, situation for them. There is also the threat that they live with as prison officers and that has an impact on them and their families and their well-being. And their well-being is absolutely critical and they do receive support and they do receive counselling where that is required. But as you know, um, I am doing work now um, and working with um, officials to look at what further support we can provide for prison officers, particularly retired prison officers, um, because often we find it's when people leave the service that the impact of, of that level of stress in their working life is felt, um, because trauma often follows um, the, the incidents. Um, many years later. Um, so we are looking at ensuring that that car is in place too, because I do believe that our people matter. Um, I believe that without our prison officers and without the staff in our prisons, without their creativity and their commitment to look after people in the prison system, we would be in a much worse situation as a society, not just in the prison system, but as a society. Um, because the work they do is absolutely crucial to rehabilitation. It is crucial to turning people's lives around. Um, and yes, they deserve the support that they need um, when that takes its toll on either their physical or their mental health. Um, but as again, I have to say, I can't comment on individual cases. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to do that. And I can't personally manage um, the staff and absence, because that is a matter for the Department of Finance, um, who manage all illness um, and HR issues um, through the Department of Finance. But I mean, if you have concerns, please do raise them uh, with the Department of Finance and with me, um, and we will try um, to raise those concerns on your behalf. Minister, if I can just come back, I, I, I have raised them. I, I've raised them. I, I've, got, I've just called out to all of the people I, I've, I've written to and spoken to about this issue. And this is not an individual. Mm. We're not talking about one individual. This might be a one individual case here. Yeah. What I'm saying now within the prison service, it is absolutely clear that mental health and going sick with mental health and a written warning is being used as a control measure. And that is people who are going off sick with stress or PTSD are coming back 
to face a written warning, or somebody with a broken ankle would not, somebody who had cancer would not, somebody who had COVID-19 will not. But if they come back with a mental health issue, they're going to get a written warning. It's a control measure. And everything you've just said to me makes absolute sense. And that needs to be poked into the civil service human resources to say that cannot be right, especially when you, as a civil service, have already absolutely stated you did have PTSD, you have been diagnosed with it, you did do everything you could possibly do to get yourself back to work, we're still giving you a written warning. There's a signal there that goes to all of your other staff, and I think it's a bad signal, and I think it needs to be taken up. I needs to be somebody needs to take this issue up. Well, I think it's it's important not to extrapolate from one case which we can't discuss the, the specifics around. One case, no, but sir. what I'm saying is we can't extrapolate from that to a wider scenario. What I can say with confidence is that at every level within the prison service, if people are anxious or in distress, um, whether they're in our care or whether they're members of our staff, they will get the right support um, and commitment. And I have to say that I would imagine that the Department of Finance and particularly HR um, we'd say that the same would be true um, of members of the wider civil service um, and the wider um, people that they manage. So, I mean, I think it's important that we don't, I don't and can't know all of those details, and even if I did, I couldn't discuss them. Um, but it's just important that we take care about extrapolating beyond that to suggest that there's a wider policy in place in some way to um, dissuade people from coming forward with mental health. I'm stating very clearly now as Minister that is not the case. Um, and nor would that be acceptable to me, um, and, and that's as clear as I can be. Yeah. To be fair to members that have put in questions, I really want to go to the specific of them. I then let others who are indicating they want to come in on other things, but for those that did put in their questions, we're well beyond the time that I think this meeting should be have concluded, and I would like to conclude the meeting sooner rather than later. But I do want to give justice to those that actually did submit them. So the next area is the court service. Um, Again, purely statistical information, staffing levels, and then uh, facilitation of parental access issues that the deputy chair had raised, if, if that can be covered. Okay. Well, in terms of the pandemic, obviously it has changed how services are provided, including courts. Um, we are continuing um, with uh, business um, as best we can under the recent directions ordered um, by the Lord Chief Justice. That means the prioritisation of cases which relate to liberty, health, safety and wellbeing. Officials are working closely with the Office of the Lord Chief Justice and other justice organisations to ensure the prioritised cases are progressed within those directions. Building on that, um, the most recent direction from the Lord Chief Justice on the 24th of April ind indicated a move to review all the cases that were listed for hearing in the near future to try to provide clarity for parties to proceedings um, so that we can then do recovery planning within the justice system. Um, with respect to the courts, as you're aware, we have responsibility for the operation of the courts, but not the scheduling of business. So it is an area where we need cooperation. There is also an issue that judges um, are also reliant on the PPS, who are again independent um, of the department um, in terms of the charges that are brought. Um, and that is again reliant on the PSNI, who will take the cases to the PPS for consideration. So there are a lot of independent parts in all of that. Um, and the scheduling of cases and so on requires a degree also of cooperation between those who are prosecuting, but also those who are defending and um, people who are coming before the court system. Um, one positive that has come out of this is that there has been a degree of cooperation in terms of early disclosure. If things are going to be adjourned and um, people are saying early that that's going to be the case to avoid having to bring people to court um, unnecessarily um, and all of those kinds of issues, I think, potentially bode well for future working. Um, at the moment, it is quite difficult, and I think it would be wrong of me to suggest otherwise, to manage social, social isolation given the age and layout of some of our court estate. Um, it's very challenging, um, but we're continuing to try to do essential business um, through a variety of means, including remote working and also rotas, where we bring people in at certain times and, and not at others. And the majority of staff are either working remotely um, or working on site or on a rota. Only 90 out of 741 staff are not working at the moment um, and are on COVID special leave because they or someone they live with is symptomatic or because they have um, responsibilities for caring for someone um, who is vulnerable.
Right. Linda, do you want to pick up then on the, the access arrangement? Yeah, obviously, I mean, the Minister had responded to that in a letter, which I do appreciate. I've, st- I've still had some queries from parents around concerns where they do have to access the courts because whilst I accept the guidance is there, uh, you know, to, to give as much guidance as you can to people who have fairly decent relationships, but the reality is most people who end up in court in the first place don't have decent relationships, and that's the problem. And obviously there will be some of these cases where there is domestic abuse and other types of yeah. abuse um, an issue as well. So I think really just in relation to that, if if we could have um, a wee bit of... And I have another question, if I can ask yeah. it after this with your indulgence, but I'll, I'll let the Minister ask this one first because it's entirely separate. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, we appreciate parents are concerned um, about contact with children in terms of what is advisable um, and what's allowable. Um, the Lord Chief Justice and the Health and Social Care Board um, issued guidance in March on child contact, and that emphasised the need to maintain contact, including court-ordered contact where it was possible. Where there are health concerns, and that render any changes necessary. So, just to be clear. Essentially, what it said is that the two households should be treated as a single household, so the children transferring um, between households wouldn't be considered to be moving location. It would be considered transfer within a single household. But that also meant that if someone in that family group became symptomatic, the entire family group uh, would self-isolate. Um, where those health concerns would render changes necessary, parents can agree variations without going back to court. Um, and that flexibility has been allowed, including substituting face-to-face contact, for example, with remote contact. Where agreement can't be reached, they can still submit um, to the court um, to see if they will decide then whether a hearing is necessary or whether simply a direction um, can be made. So they'll judge the urgency of each case um, and whether that needs to be taken back to court. We have tried to address the concerns that parents have um, through a joint ministerial statement, which I had issued with the Health Minister in regards to this, um, based on what the Lord Chief Justice and the Health um, and Social Services um, guidance was. So we're also referring people to that, and we're reviewing and updating that as we go. So I think that there are issues there. I think there's another complication in that there can be those who will use the pandemic itself to thwart contact or increase alienation. And so it is difficult um, to address that. However, decisions on moving between homes for parents, um, I think you have to look at the risk of infection, presence um, of vulnerable individuals in households, um, and also the child's present health, um, and whether or not there are any issues there. Ideally, again, you want parents to be able to reach an agreement themselves. Legal representatives have been working really hard um, to help them reach solutions that would align with the status quo if they're not exactly um, replicating what's already there. But where agreement is impossible, um, the Lord Chief Justice has reassured them that um, the court will consider the reasonableness of actions during this time when considering future orders, and that if parents are being unduly denied access to their children, that they may make up that time later um, through changes in the orders that are issued in future. So if someone unnecessarily deprives a partner of seeing their child, um, they may find that the balance and future orders changes in order to make up that lost time. Parents who are sufficiently concerned can ask for an urgent hearing, and that will be done on a case-by-case basis as to whether or not um, it's, it's required. Um, also, in terms of supervised contact, that's really a matter for the Department of Health. Um, the Health and Social Care Board issued guidance on the 31st of March saying that supervised contact um, may be suspended um, and that they were advising social workers to liaise with parents about using remote contact where direct contact was impossible. Um, in practice, trusts are assessing the risks of direct supervised contact on a case-by-case basis and where it's possible are continuing to provide that. Um, and then I suppose finally the issue is um, around parents not being able to reach agreements themselves where the underlying relationships perhaps um, don't permit that, um, or where they use a contact centre because of concerns about welfare issues or domestic abuse. Um, again, that's primarily a health issue in that they provide those um, contact centre facilities. And I can ask the Department of Health, obviously, to clarify that if it would be helpful, um, and if it's something that the committee would want more information on. 
However, where there's a court direction for contact to be supervised by an adult agreed by the parties, it would be for that to continue unless there is a specific COVID-19 risk um, that's been identified where they need to be revised because the contact centres have suspended their arrangements. Um, they're, they're negotiating between the parties and their legal representatives with support of social workers um, to come up with alternative arrangements. Any parent concerned about the safety of a child um, can report their concerns in the normal way, and that will be treated as a priority. So um, it is a difficult situation, um, but it is one that I think, um, if people are concerned, they have the opportunity um, to be able to either reach agreement through their legal reps or to go back to the court if they feel that's absolutely necessary. Um, but we're trying to limit that as much as is possible. Okay. Just in, in relation to um, fee paid members of the judiciary, can they be furloughed? I will need to check. I, I will need to check. I know we are doing work around barristers and solicitors, but I got a paper recently around issues with the judiciary. But I'll need to go back and check because I don't recall I'm the details. I'm assuming at the moment that, that that isn't happening because this has come to me from somebody who's okay. concerned, obviously, about their own. I think, I, I think the same person may have written to me, and that's why I've seen a paper uh, on this, because I think I'd requested more information. Um, so I'll have to come back to you on that one because I think I've been contacted as well. I know it's something that's been raised with me because I recall reading um, reading the guides. Unfortunately, I have to say I don't recall what was in it, but I do. I have actually read. Um, it, it rings a bell because I've been dealing with that. Could I get a response just yes. in writing? I'm fine. Yes, of course. That's right. Has the legal aid okay. scheme that we got the briefing on now started to be implemented? Um, I think it's due to be rolled out from. Is it? I think it's actually this week or next week it's due to be rolled out, so it's being implemented. The last issue there was just the fee. Yeah, there, there is. I mean, I am due, I think, to have a conversation um, with um, some people from the Bar Association just around the, the fee level. I understand the issue that's being raised, but again, there is an issue around the budget that we have to work within. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do um, is to allow people, if you like, to claim in advance. And we do that at some risk, because obviously if somebody decides to um, change their solicitor down the line, um, there there will be consequences there where essentially you'll need to will either need to recoup that money or ask somebody to pay and so on. So there's a there's a degree of risk associated with the scheme, but I think it's I think it's a measured risk that we've taken, in the sense that we cannot operate the justice system without um, solicitors and barristers, and like everyone else, they have bills to pay. Um, and their inability to do their job at the moment is not as a result of them. It is as a result of the, the crisis. And in the same way that I think we are looking at supplier relief um, in other parts of the economy, it is only fair and just that we do the same when it comes to um, those who work within the justice system. I mean, having, having good, qualified, experienced barristers and solicitors um, is absolutely critical to the functioning of justice. So we don't want to see people go out of business um, as a result of this epidemic, um, and it's important that we give them the support. But I mean, I've, I, I would have been surprised had there not been some challenge on the amounts, um, because I think that that would be expected. Um, but we have to balance the risk to public finance against the desire to support people. But I'm due to have another conversation um, with them very shortly. Okay. Finally, just there were three questions on the domestic violence and abuse, and it may well have already been covered for, for some members from Tuesday. I know, Paul, you had asked, uh, as had Linda and Rachel, around um, statistics and, and getting a breakdown of figures. If you just want to cover that area, and then I'll, I'll bring in those members if they wish. Well, I mean, in terms of figures, um, I, I have some figures I would want to share with you. Um, some people, I think, had asked about the helpline, and I just maybe wanted to give you some statistics around this. Um, during this period, the domestic abuse helpline, the gender of callers who have made contact have been 72% female, 13% male, 1% transgender, and 14% undisclosed, 
which would be where someone was phoning perhaps on behalf of someone else but didn't specify, so they were ringing about concerns they had for another individual. Um, the key issues presented, um, I can give you percentages, but bear in mind um, they don't add up to 100% in case you think my maths is very bad. Um, some of them will obviously be multiple issues raised in one call, so um, that explains why they don't add up. I wouldn't take the risk of giving such um, poor adding up in Deborah's uh, presence, because I know she would correct me. Um, so, 28% um, um, was for physical or intimate partner violence, 27% emotional abuse, 25% uh, coercive control, 15% for verbal abuse, 15% for bullying, 9% for financial control, 9% for rape, 8% for child sex abuse, and 6% for sexual assault. So that gives a, a breakdown um, of the kind of calls that would be coming through the, the helpline um, for that period um, during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and as you can see, it's a very broad range, um, but also some quite serious um, issues that are being raised with the helpline at this time. Shocking, shocking. Um, Paul, and yeah, then just do it quick quick quick, because I know time is running on. Uh, with regards to the, uh, we all expected these issues to rise uh, when people were in lockdown. Uh, we are all expecting that, but. Women's Aid would be a wee bit worried and nervous about the fact that they aren't necessarily seeing that relating in referrals. Is there anything that you can shine light on there with regards to science in that, as to why if, if we have an increased level, that the referrals then should really be increased also, but they're not? Well, I think that there are a number of things to bear in mind. Um, I think, first of all, as you know, we have been extending our own advertising campaign around the health lines and raising awareness. We spent quite a lot of time doing that on social media as well. So an increase in reporting doesn't necessarily mean an increase in incidents, but it may mean an increase in awareness of the support mechanisms in place. And it may also mean an increase in people's um, vigilance on these issues. I think also the fact that increasingly now people no longer see domestic abuse as a private matter behind closed doors, but are actually willing to intervene if they hear a family member is being abused, if they witness a neighbour um, being abused. So sometimes what is being reported um, on a helpline or where advice is being sought, it isn't necessarily um, as a result of a, a complaint being referred to the police. Um, in terms of the police, they haven't seen the same spike in calls that has been reflected from helpline support. But that doesn't mean to say that people won't come forward after with, with these issues. So there is, I think, work that needs to be done in preparation as we move out of this phase um, to start to prepare for people coming forward about abuse that has happened in the last number of weeks and they then present. The other issue, I suppose, is that for children in particular who have either witnessed um, or been subject to abuse, often the place where that is picked up first is in school. And when children are out of school um, and isolated from their normal uh, structures, that may not be being identified as quickly um, as would otherwise be the case. So I think that disparity, we will only really see the full picture of this. Um, at the other side of the crisis. I don't think we will know for sure whether the calls are people seeking support, guidance, advice, help, um, or whether it's a particular issue in terms of um, incidents for referral. There may also be a reluctance um, from some people to, for example, leave the home during the crisis because they're afraid that by moving they could be exposing their children to to the risk of COVID-19 and other things. So we need to look at all that in the round and try to get a clearer picture. But we want to work with those who are providing the advice, those who provide the support. Um, and also then in the longer term, we want to look at how the criminal justice system will respond um, when people come forward um, subsequently. It would be surprising if we weren't seeing an increase in domestic abuse and violence at this time and that we have a very uncertain and stressful situation. We have people removed from their networks of support. We have social isolation. 
um, and we have also witnessed that it has happened in other countries. I do want to correct one thing because I'd said in the debate on Tuesday that there were four domestic homicides, and that was the advice of the police at that time. That is actually now they said three domestic homicides, and that one is now being treated as not a suspicious death. So it's three domestic homicides in that period. I've written to the speaker to correct the record on that as well, but I just wanted to let the committee know that as well. Okay, thank you. But it's still a significant yeah, sure. issue. Thank you, Linda. Just a very quick thing on what you said about around obviously children and those cases being picked up within school. Are you working with the Education Minister in terms of, of these issues? Because there is probably pieces of work that could be done by youth services in this time who know and very often who the, who the at-risk children are that they work with and who would have ways of getting that door opened just to make sure that those children are okay where maybe others wouldn't, um, and then also in terms of whenever we start returning to school, because obviously we might not be returning to school in the manner in which it, it, it was previously. We don't know what it's going to look like, and I'm not going to speculate for all the reasons that you highlighted earlier, but I do think that there needs to be a very specific piece of work around if whenever we are returning to school, looking at those children who are going, who are likely to need that intervention more than most, and who are likely to be most impacted by not being at school for a long period of time. So it just, I, I'm, I'm not even asking you to, to give me answers to all of that today, but I, I do want to flag it up that for me, that would be a concern. Those children need to be identified as being a priority. I appreciate that, and I think that those children who are most vulnerable, both during the crisis and after the crisis, there will be a piece of work to be done within education, and I'm sure um, that the Minister for Education is you know, is acutely aware that there will be a piece of work to be done to recover. There will be issues around stress, anxiety, all of the issues that we've been talking about, mental health, um, social isolation, um, interactions and developmental issues with children particularly who have been withdrawn from society for a period of time. I think that will that there will be a big piece of work to be done within schools. And we know that adverse childhood experiences have an impact on people later in life, so we need to get this right, and it's something that I think both health, education, justice and communities all have a role to play in terms of what the recovery plan looks like. It isn't just an economic recovery that we need, it is a social recovery um, as well that we are going to need as a result of this, and that will mean looking at the impact that this lockdown has had. Um, children who are at very delicate stages of their um, social development, their language development, um, their interaction skills and bonding will find this quite difficult potentially to go back to school after a period of being away. Um, and it is quite difficult for parents to explain at the minute. I mean, one of my friends, um, young son, asked, you know, have I been good enough that I'm allowed to go back to school yet? because he sees it as a punishment not to go to school. And she's trying to explain to him, yeah, you're brilliant, but unfortunately we're not quite there yet, you know, but it, it is it is tough um, for, for children to understand why they're being deprived of that ability to socialise and spend time together. Um, and it's very difficult. Uh, some adults are struggling with the concept. You can imagine what it's like through the eyes of a five-year-old. Um, so, you know, it is, it's a very, very difficult time and they will need a lot of support and encouragement um, going forward. But I have no doubt whatsoever that, um, that the Education Minister will be planning for that and supporting teachers to be able um, to do that. And also the teachers' own mental health, because what they may be confronted with when they go back might be quite different to what they're used to. Rachel. Thank you. Just two very quick ones. Just to clarify, in terms of the statistics given, was that for the 24-hour domestic and sexual abuse helpline? Yeah. And um, this period, what you mentioned this, the statistic for this period, what does that cover? That is the 24-hour domestic and sexual abuse helpline. Um, and I'm just trying to see... Um, what the period it would have been during the pandemic so i would imagine that it refers to that period i will check but i would imagine it refers to the period during the lockdown yeah it says increase in reporting um during the the lockdown so i'm imagining that that's the period but i will check the dates um against those Thank just you. to have clarity on that that would be good to have um and just in terms of the expectancy that perhaps referrals might increase after this period um and again, this might not be one um, we're expecting an answer from, but in terms of engaging with the Department for Communities, I had written um, on the increased uh, need for resources and funding 
um, on this issue, perhaps for refuges or for other support services. But if we are expecting an increase, um, then we would obviously be expecting an increase in funding and resources to be allocated to, to adapt to that. I would totally agree. And I also think that there is an issue about ensuring that we don't look for short term measures that will deal with an immediate crisis but that don't provide a long-term solution so if someone leaves the family home um, with their children that is a massive decision and one that we know places them at huge risk if they then find themselves isolated in a hostel um, with nowhere to go from there to re-establish some kind of normal life um, the drawback to the, f the family home is huge um, but we know that when people return, often the abuse will escalate over time. Um, so it is important if we want people to be able to break free of domestic abuse and violence, that we offer people a stable pathway um, in order to be able to re-establish um, a life without abuse. Um, and that isn't just for the pandemic, that is for a permanent response. So we've looked at the immediate issues around ensuring that people are able to find somewhere safe and secure that's socially distanced, which isn't always possible in a hostel. So we've looked at that as, a, as an emergency issue, and I know that um, Deirdre Hargey has, has done a, a work on that. Um, but we also are very conscious in the conversations that we've had around this of the need for there to be a pathway from that to permanent accommodation. Um, and I also, as I said in the debate, I, mean, I think it's hugely important that we don't presume that the person who is the victim should have to leave their home and give up their life um, you know, it is it is possible for the abuser to be the one who is removed from the home. Um, it is possible for the family to maintain their life where it is, um, and for more work to be done on that. And again, the housing executive has done a really good piece of work on that. Um, but I think there could be more maybe done around housing associations and even private landlords, um, so that they also work with us in terms of ensuring that those who are their tenants are able to re remain safely in their, ho their own home um, when they have broken the bonds with the abuser um, and that they don't have to be the one that uproots their life um, and potentially their family and their children um, and go through all of that trauma because of what someone else has done to them. Okay. Um, there's a couple of members, Minister, with your indulgence, have been indicating earlier. So I want to wrap this up. So if there's specific questions some members that haven't been covered want to raise, Gordon, you've indicated, and yeah. Gemma. Totally different subject, but one that's been in the media a lot. PPE, are you satisfied that you have adequate supplies of uh, compliant PPE? And I know, Debbie, you've done work on it. We've got a circular about that. Uh, for obviously the police service, uh, which you have an indirect responsibility. I understand a lot of it was procured through the central procurement department. Uh, and are you now satisfied that we have adequate PPE for police, prison service, and other justice staff, and that it, at the that, moment, that is compliant? At the moment, we are. Anything that we feel isn't compliant isn't used, and people have been instructed that if they have any doubts about the, the, the equipment that is provided, that they should not use it um, and that they should query it. And we encourage them to do that because it is about safety. Um, so it is important that people feel that they can do that if they have, if they have concerns. Um, there have been issues with PPE. There is no question about that. Um, right from the outset, there was a shortage globally. I mean, it does not help that most of the suppliers were in Wuhan in China, where the outbreak first took hold. Um, and there was a kind of golden moment when um, we were able to procure PPE, but perhaps um, that went very quickly as the outbreak then reached the States and other places and you had real demand um, growth. We have had local suppliers who have been doing quite a lot of work um, around some of this. Um, and that, I think, is something that we need to look at for future resilience. It's something we've discussed with Executive. That whilst obviously you look at the cost implications um, of procurement, that you also need to look at the resilience of your supply lines. And I think one thing that a global pandemic puts um, in context is that when you're reliant for international um, companies to deliver your local needs, whilst that may be efficient and effective in the majority of cases, having local suppliers can also be hugely important. And that's a discussion that we'll have to have at the other side of this. Um, around how we look at securing supply. Um, but at the moment, certainly the Chief Constable, I spoke with him yesterday, as I, as I usually do, he is content that they have the PPE they need. 
Um, I've spoken with the um, Director General from Prison Service. Again, he is content that they have the PPE they need and are using it as appropriate under PHA advice. And that would be true um, not only for their own staff, but for example, in prisons or in, um, in, in the custody suites for the police. They also have a supply there for um, solicitors who would be coming to do um, in-person interviews with their clients. Um, and they will be able to provide them with PPE where it's required that they actually have a face-to-face -face interview. So, yes, I mean, it is a, it's a complex situation, but it is one where they, they feel secure. Um, and obviously that's part of the job of PPE is to reassure the staff who are putting themselves in the front line that they are properly protected. I think the issue of con a consistent quality standard is, you know, is something that needs to be noted. And I think it's important that the, you know, the standards are acquired consistently throughout the suppliers. And I think that you know, would go a long way to address concerns of individuals. Um, the Procurement Directorate and others um, took the benefit of having people on site um, in a number of the remote locations where we were procuring um, PPE um, in order to be able to check at source that the production of what was being brought here was to the adequate standards. That's something that the executive um, felt was important. Um, so that, that has been an ongoing issue, and we took yeah. the opportunity to do that where we could. Okay, thanks, Minister. Thank thanks, Chair. Gemma. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to go back to the topic of domestic violence and abuse. Just Has there been any work done on the introduction of a strategy um, for during COVID and maybe even beyond for introducing um, code words in the likes of pharmacies and supermarkets and stuff? Yes, um, it's actually something we raised initially um, with the Department of Health some time ago. Um, they have a really good scheme um, in, um, I think it's in Spain, where if people ask for, I'm not going to try the Spanish, um, <laughs> but if people ask for mask 19 when they go into a pharmacy, it's a code okay. to say that they um, are at risk of domestic abuse or violence. They then take a seat um, and the pharmacist will deal with that um, and have a protocol to go through to ensure that that person gets help and assistance so it's, a, it's seen as a safe place to go. We raised it with the Department of Health who looked at that um, and one of the concerns obviously they had was that the pressure on pharmacies yeah. is so huge at the moment um, that it was going to be difficult. The reason it was pharmacies that were selected in Spain was because they had a very strict lockdown where there were only a certain number of places you could go of which pharmacies was one. Um, but that's still in train and we're actually looking at the potential of using that because it is something that even longer term might be quite useful where people don't feel I mean we forget sometimes that we talk about lockdown increasing the risk um, of domestic abuse and violence but for some people who are subjected to coercive control they're in lockdown almost permanently mm -hmm. and actually leaving the home can be incredibly difficult even under normal circumstances so in those cases something like a trip to the pharmacy might be one of the few opportunities they ever get yeah. to raise an issue um, because often their partner will even attend a GP appointment and sit in and try to, you know, when GPs have to be really conscious of that as well. So that's another issue that we're looking at. Um, and, but that, I mean, that's something that the Department of Health are looking at in conjunction with um, the domestic violence um, people in our team to try and see are there ways that we can have that kind of mechanism in place. I think it's important mm -hmm. um, that we make help as accessible as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes the session, Minister, much longer than I had anticipated. But I, I want to thank you for, for spending the time with us and uh -huh. your department for the continued engagement. Um, it is appreciated. Obviously, it's a very dynamic situation and things are emerging. And, and um, hopefully, we're going to have that same responsive nature if, if it requires a a further meeting, but I want to thank you for that. Absolutely. And can I just say, without labouring the point, um, thank you to the committee. <clears throat> it has been really, really helpful um, just that you have continued to meet um, as you have, and also that you've continued to take an active interest. And you might find that strange coming from me, given that you grill me when I come in, but I actually think it's healthy and helpful. Um, the debate, I think, was very useful on Tuesday. It has highlighted some areas I think that we can um, look at and talk through. Um, there are some ideas that we're actually discussing today um, in response to some of the areas of concern that different members have raised in the debate to see, because not all of them will lie within the gift of the Department of Justice, but there may be things that we can do to offer comfort um, that we're not ignoring the issues that have been raised and we'll continue to respond as productively as we can. Um, but I'm looking forward to the committee stage of the bill. I wish you well with it. 
um, I would encourage you not to um, tamper too far um, with what we're trying to achieve, because I would love to see it in place as quickly as possible. But I do wish you well, because I think the scrutiny is hugely important, and I really respect the role the committees play. Um, most of the time I've been in this assembly, it has been to scrutinise what ministers are doing rather than on this side of the table. And I can assure you, um, I recognise how important it is. Um, so thank you for what you're doing at the moment. Well, we appreciate that, and we have proposals to agree on the, the time frame and our next steps on that once you leave. So well, thank I, you. I have to say that I thought it was particularly good that we met the deadline of getting our bill to the Assembly on the same day as Westminster. Yeah. So we're not behind yet. I'll leave that with you, Chairman. No problem. <laughs> well, thank you, Minister. Thank you. Members, we'll take a, a short comfort break for five minutes, and then there is business that we want to get through, and it would avoid a meeting next week if we're able to do that. So if you can bear with us, um, we'll, we'll reconvene in five minutes. Members, item five, uh, domestic abuse family proceedings bill. Oh yes, apologies. Um, in terms of some of the uh, the papers that we have received in response to the COVID nineteen issues over the past weeks, if members are agreed, we'll put that onto the committee web page just to assist with the transparency. If you're content. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Item five, domestic abuse family proceedings bill. Um, it has been referred, as members know, to the committee to undertake the committee stage of the bill. A provisional timetable for the committee stage has been provided at pages 80 and 81 of your table pack. It takes into account the committee's wish to undertake robust scrutiny of the bill while taking no longer than uh, necessary. The timetable is based on the provision of four weeks for submission of written evidence on the bill, a one-month period to take oral evidence from key stakeholders and victims of domestic abuse, and approximately one month then for the committee to consider the key issues raised and potential amendments, to discuss and reach position on the clauses and schedules in the bill, and agree the committee report. Taking into account the summer recess period, committee stage uh, would finish in mid-October or slightly earlier if the time scale can be met efficiently. So, it's if members are content, Linda. Just one quick point, um, Chair. I'm agreed with all of it, and I'm happy to go with it. Just, I think we should leave ourselves flexible during the summer period because most of us aren't going to be going anywhere now. Yeah. But, and, and I'm not saying that we would necessarily come in, but we might want to if it's going to help us speed things up. And I, I wouldn't have any objections to to facilitating that during during the summer period if, if others are are agreeable. I think it'll help us just to move things on. I know the, my discussions with the clerk, just in terms of the, the management of it from a staffing point of view, for us to, to try and conclude the, the evidence session gathering will allow the committee to work up what will be a very significant report, and they are going to need time to do that. And that is where the summer months are being built in for all of that report writing to take place, um, where we can bring forward then if that report was concluded before we would come back in September. I certainly have no objection to that, but July and August is primarily being left not for us not to do anything on it, but having us done our work and the evidence for the staff to write up everything so that we can then come back to it. So, um, But the point yeah. the point's made, wh where we can accelerate this, um, I, I'm certainly more than keen to do that, while still doing justice to the evidence <coughs> that we need. Thank Rachel. you, just to um, totally support um, that call for the flexibility. Um, I'm keen to get as much evidence from all organisations and stakeholders that we can possibly do, but mindful obviously we are in a health pandemic and that might not always be possible to a strict date. So if we can get any flexibility in terms of that 5th of June and if people submit late or, or, or during the, the report writing that we are able to still consider their evidence. Okay. Any other members wanting to comment? No, I, I think I'm, I'm happy enough with the timescales. There are other bills going through committee stages at the minute that, that are looking at December deadline, so that's quite ambitious, to be honest with you. Uh, so, fair play. Yep. Let's, let's try and blast it out. Yep. Okay. Well, um, I, I take the point Rachel has made. Um, if you're content, Friday the 5th of June it will be the deadline we'll put out in the written evidence. Obviously, where there's exceptionality that comes in and a case can be made, I'm sure the committee will be amenable to that. Um, but if members are content, we'll initially go with the 5th of June for receipt of written evidence, and then the proposed timetable for the committee stage, um, as outlined. 
Okay, there will be a motion to extend the committee stage, and that will be prepared for the committee's consideration in light of the timetable that we have uh, agreed, and that will come back to the committee. Um, we don't need to lay that in the assembly just yet, um, but <coughs> we, we will come back to that. Um, it's also good practice when seeking written evidence on a bill for a committee to issue a media signposting notice, inviting organisations or individuals with an interest in the bill to submit written evidence and also write to key stakeholders. There is a draft media signposting notice to be placed in the three main newspapers and on the Assembly website, and it is at page 82 of your table pack. The link to the committee webpage notice will also be advertised on the committee's Twitter account. There is a draft list of key stakeholders to which it is proposed the committee should write. Um, and that's been provided in the table pack. There's a draft letter uh, to stakeholders inviting them to give written evidence, and the letter highlights a number of areas on which views would be particularly welcome. The committee webpage uh, notice will also <coughs> highlight those areas and will indicate the committee particularly uh, wanting to hear from victims of uh, domestic abuse. So, if members first of all are content to agree the draft media posting notice, agreed. agreed. Uh, if you are content um, with the list of key stakeholders, members are at liberty to add any others to that that you wish to count as a key stakeholder. It is a very broad list whenever I looked at it, um, and, and there may be some that do not provide any evidence. So if, if there are others, let Christine know. Um, but that, that is the list at this stage. Obviously, it does not preclude anybody from giving evidence. You do not need to have been on the list of the key stakeholders, but that primarily is the group that we would formally write to. Um, but uh, it certainly is not to restrict others that aren't included in that from giving evidence. So, if members are content with with that current list, um, then we'll issue it directly to them as well. Agreed. Agreed. And if you're content then with the content in the draft letter that goes to the stakeholders uh, on the, the views, particularly that's being sought, if members are content. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. There's an electronic bill folder will be set up. Uh, on the uh, electronic system <coughs> containing the bill, the explanatory memorandum, background policy papers, research papers, written submissions, and other documents to provide easy access for members to all of the relevant papers. Thank you. Item six. Uh, this is the private international law uh, bill draft committee report. Again, there's some formality tests that I just need to go through, but. Um, in the meeting pack, there is a draft report of the committee's consideration of the LCM uh, for agreement at our meeting. Uh, there is a typographical or formatting errors. Uh, if any typographical or formatting errors in the report, they will be amended at the briefing stage before being circulated to MLAs and published on the committee web page. So if members are content, um, if they have any proposed amendments uh, to the draft report, uh, if, or if you are content with it, then I need to just go through a number of steps just to get formal agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Linda. Just obviously, you know, the issues that I had with this at the beginning, those issues still stand. I just want to place that on the record. But I, I mean, I haven't read through the papers. It's been laid now in, in the Scottish Assembly, as far as I'm aware. Um, I'm not. It's not a day in the ditch. I'm not looking to block it. But I still think that I, I'm, I'm not content. I'm not happy that the department gave a good enough reason as to why they wouldn't want to put in place something that this committee would have the opportunity to scrutinise. But as I say, I'm not, I'm not wanting to block it at this stage. Okay. Well, let's take uh, uh, my battles. Minutes, one of them. We'll record in the minutes. Yeah. Yeah, we'll certainly we'll record that the caveat to the, to the position. Okay. Um, then, in terms of the front page and contents, um, <coughs> our members contend that the front page and contents page stand part of the report. Agreed. Agreed. Are members content that the background section of paragraphs 1 to 7 stand part of the report? Agreed. 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 Are members content that paragraphs 8 to 10, which outline the purpose of the LCM, stand part of the report? Agreed. 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 Are members um, content that paragraphs 11 to 20 stand part of the report? Agreed. Agreed. And on the conclusion, are members content that the conclusion section of paragraph 21 stand part of the report? Agreed. And appendices, are members content that the appendices stand part of the report? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, and if members are content to agree um, to clear the draft minutes of this meeting, and then uh, with the comments that Linda has made, that will be included in Appendix 2 uh, to enable the report to be finalised, and the draft minutes will be replaced by the final version of, of uh, the minutes once agreed by the committee. Members content? Right. 
and our members content to agree for the report to be published on the committee's web page and issued to all MLAs. Agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Okay, members, committee staff will notify members when a date for the debate on the LCM has been scheduled in the Assembly. Um, thank you for that. Item 7. <coughs> the Department is proposing to extend provisions dealing with extraterritorial jurisdiction in the UK Domestic Abuse Bill uh, to Northern Ireland by way of an LCM. The Domestic Abuse Bill provides provisions to allow the UK to ratify the Istanbul Convention on Preventing and Combating <coughs> Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. While courts in Northern Ireland already have extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction for a number of offences required by the Convention, there are a number of sexual and violent offences that are currently not covered. Uh, the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill includes provisions for extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction for the proposed Northern Ireland domestic abuse offence. In addition, a stalking bill, which is also expected to include provision for prosecution of offences that occur overseas, is scheduled for introduction later in the year. Until these become law, the UK Government considers that inclusion of the offence of putting people in fear of violence and sexual and violent offences to be sufficient to allow for the ratification of the Convention. So, members, it's to seek your views as to whether you are content on the proposal to extend these provisions that relate to extraterritorial jurisdiction in, UK, in the UK Domestic Abuse Bill to Northern Ireland by way of an LCM, or whether any further information is required. Linda. Require further information, and I'm, I'm content with it. Just want to check: does it interfere in any way with the with our own domestic abuse bill and, and the stuff in relation to extra? I think we can go with the LCM. It goes ahead, and our bill will go in parallel and carry on. But we'd need to check then. Okay, that's all. That's just. I mean, I don't think the LCM doesn't hold up our bill, and our bill doesn't hold up the LCM. The two, the two will progress. That's okay. Okay. So members content then that we we note the the information that's been provided, and we'll get that clarified. Just. Christine for Linda would be appreciated, but um, otherwise we're content that it proceeds. Okay, item eight, um, LCM on a sentencing bill. The, the committee considered a written briefing on the proposed LCM on uh, the sentencing bill at our meeting on the 23rd of April. Agreed that an oral briefing from the department on the proposed LCM was not required. The LCM was laid by the department on the 27th of April. Understanding Order 42A7, the committee now would have up to 15 days to complete its report to the assembly. So, members, it's again just to seek your views as to whether you are content with the proposal to extend the provisions relating to the transfer of community orders, youth rehabilitation orders, and suspended sentence orders imposed by the courts in England and Wales to Northern Ireland in the sentencing bill uh, to Northern Ireland by way of the LCM. I assume members are content because we've, we've considered this before. So, yeah. content. Okay, item nine. Um, is on the Department of Justice's budget, the uh, consideration of the committee um, position. Um, there was a paper circulated uh, to members on this issue. At last week's meeting, the committee agreed a series of questions um, on the Department's 2020 <coughs> 21 budget for submission. Um, the Department's response was received. It was circulated to members on Monday, and it is included in the meeting pack. Um, as agreed last week, there is a draft response on the Department's 2020-21 budget. It has been prepared for consideration and agreement. Um, members, I have considered it. I am content with it. Um, it raises, I think, a number of very good points and is a well-written report. Is there any comments members want to make that they have not already considered? Well, just, just maybe that Obviously, the minister wasn't able to give us any real detail today around what, you know, and going forward, what mightn't be able to happen, and therefore reallocating those resources. I would just, I think, the committee needs to be kept updated whenever we do have that information because it's important. We want to, we want to ensure that. I mean, she said herself, she's not open not to give too much money back, and that that's okay. But we want to make sure it's been well spent and that, mm -hmm. you know, it is being reallocated and that we're not ending up in a situation where. At the end of of the period, that a lot of money has been handed back, or that we look back at it then and think, why was that spent on that? That, mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been, you know, something the committee would have necessarily agreed was a priority. So, <coughs> no, it's a valid point, and it's, it's one that's reflected in the paper. Um, and and the committee for finance will get that. DOJ is the only department that hasn't provided some information uh, around that. So. 
um, around some of these issues, and, and that's, I think it's right that we flag it up. Um, and uh, if members are content, then that that'll be the committee position as outlined in the paper that was circulated. Okay, agreed. Agreed. Um, the, the response will be submitted to the committee for finance and forwarded to the Department of Justice and Assembly Research Service as previously agreed. Um, item 10 is correspondence. There are five items. I will draw attention to a couple of them. Um, item 3 um, and item 6 of the table pack uh, relates to a copy of a letter from the Permanent Secretary, um, Peter May, to the Committee for Finance on the Offences and Penalties aspects of Mr Allister's Functioning of Government uh, Miscellaneous Amendments Bill. The Finance Committee has asked for the views of uh, this committee. Um, since the pack issued, Mr Allister has sent, sent a copy of his response to Peter May, and this is included uh, in the tabled pack. So, it's, if members are content, we will ask the Permanent Secretary to respond, uh, to provide a copy of his response to Mr Allister's correspondence to assist with our consideration of this matter, and when that is received, we can come back to, to this issue. Members Agreed. content? Agreed. Item 7. Um, there is a response from the Department of Justice to the NIO uh, Minister's letter regarding funding of the separated regime in McGabry, providing an update on the current position regarding the independent review and separated reg uh, regime recommended by the independent panel. The Department is of the view that pursuing the principle of where responsibility lies for the funding of the separated reg regime is still an important and current uh, consideration. So that is there for members to note, unless you have some points you want to clarify on that. If not, members content that we action the correspondence that is contained as outlined in the clerk's memo? Agreed. Okay. I have no business. Is there any other business? There is no other business, members. It is my intention, unless we need to, um, that we will schedule a meeting for the week commencing the 11th of May and we will provide information on that in due course. Okay, thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.